Hi, I'm Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode. Uh, this episode was recorded on Friday, September twenty first, two thousand eighteen, starting at three fifty nine. Actually, it just turned to four four p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this is the hundred and seventy second episode of the show. For more information about how to subscribe to the podcast and help support the production of future episodes by becoming a patron, please visit theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with Lisa Scheim, and we're going to be uh, taking some questions from listeners of the podcast that have been sent in over the past few months. Uh, hey, Lisa, thanks for joining me today. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, yeah, so I've been meaning to do a Q&A episode here for a while now, and there's been both different questions that have been submitted over the past few months from listeners. There's also some carryover questions from two other Q and A's that I did earlier this year, where I just didn't get to all of the questions because there's always more than we have time for. So uh, yeah, I thought we could do like kind of a casual podcast going through them today. For those of you who, in, in the description for both the video version of this episode and the audio version. I'll try to put a list of timestamps for what questions we address, as well as what sort of time in the video or the audio that we address them. Um, so if I don't have that up already when you're watching this, then it means it hasn't been created yet. But hopefully at some point we'll have that up so that you can sort of jump through to different parts of the recording if you want to skip certain questions. Um, let's see, any other preliminary stuff that we were supposed to cover before we, or that we should cover before we move on? Um, exciting shirts are in the astrology shirts. podcast shirts. Right, we both have our our cool new astrology podcast shirt. So I've got my logo shirt for the astrology podcast, mm -hmm. and you've got which one are you wearing? I've today? got the zodiac wheel, which is very colorful, especially awesome. if you put it on a dark background. The zodiac one looks great. That was designed by pa Paula Bello Belluomini, uh, who consequently, actually, I literally just like thirty minutes ago got a package in the mail. Of the Llewellyn 2019 Planetary uh, Daily Planetary Guide, and Paula is actually one of the designers. She just took over and is one of the co-designers for this calendar, which is like super exciting because this is one of the highest like circulation astrology calendars and planners that exists out there. And she just recently this year took over as the lead designer for this calendar, which is really awesome to me because she's. A good friend and has been a long time uh, sort of person I've been working with on different design things. Like she did the cover for my book uh, a couple of years ago. She also helped me to design the uh, Planet Watcher calendars last year, as well as the Planetary Movements calendar. So it's cool. And I think she also just became the regional vice president of ESAR like just a few days ago for uh, Brazil. So yeah, good job to her. And for the t-shirts, I guess you can find out more information about those. I have a link to them on the podcast website, which is the uh, astrologypodcast.com. And if you go to the store section, so the astrologypodcast.com slash store, you'll see a link to all the t-shirts. So yeah, they're nice and super soft. Uh, they I are think really the soft, other. actually. <laughs> Right, because I popped for the the like higher quality material ones. That's like an extra dollar, a few dollars to produce, but it ended up being worth it. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so let's see what else is going on. What's been going on? What have you been working on lately? Mainly electional stuff. Yeah, wedding elections. Um, a few rectification um, requests have come in since we did that podcast um, with you and me and Patrick, um, and. Yeah, just I'd I'd say the usual mix of those and consultations. Awesome. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you've been you were you got like a feature or referred to in like one of the major wedding magazines or something. Oh and yeah, that's been dri driving like a lot of like wedding elections your way, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, someone from Refinery Twenty Nine wrote a little um, brief article after they talked with me about kind of how you how you might start going about choosing a good wedding date. And I mostly spoke about um, Venus signs and moon signs. It didn't get too intricate, you know, based on the length of what was possible. But it got reproduced um, on brides.com, which is like a really high circulating um, bridal magazine and a couple other places. And I don't really know how that works, if they like w were OK with that being reprinted or what. But in any case, the end result was that it was kind of all over the place. Right. Awesome. And uh, you've also been doing a lot of like natal consultations lately. 
Yeah, yeah. I've been really enjoying the natal consultations lately. And we'll get into, I think, maybe something that touches on this in one of the um, questions in the Q&A. But, you know, it's just always so interesting to see how um, kind of basic placements can manifest in so many different ways in real life and so many different specifics that are possible. Right. Definitely. All right, cool. Well, so let's get into it. So we've got a bunch of questions that have come from a bunch of different sources. A lot of these or most of them are from patrons or people that support the podcast through our page on Patreon. We've got a few that are from Twitter and a few that are from Facebook. Um, there were some recent ones that came through Twitter that are relatively quick and easy to answer. So I thought we'd knock out a few of those really quickly. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, the first one that I wanted to knock out quickly, it's from uh, Carly Jane Locke at Stellar Reporter on Twitter. She says, as far as celebrity endorsements of astrology goes, which famous personalities come to mind? Who regularly consults or has studied or has been vocal about their knowledge? So I was trying to think of this, and there was like a few that came to mind immediately, but I know I'm spacing out some. But the biggest celebrity endorsement in recent years that comes to mind for me is Robert Downey Jr., who um, is evidently a client of Stephen Forrest's and who wrote an endorsement for one of his books just a few years back, where I think it was like on the cover of the book or the back cover of the book, he sort of endorsed Stephen as his his astrologer and for his sort of consulting knowledge, I guess, because they've been uh, working together for for a while, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen that around as well. And I think Sting was another one, if I'm remembering correctly, um, who was another Stephen Forrest person. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's tricky about answering this question is the problem is that we don't actually probably know. There's like 90 probably like 99% or like 95%, like some ridiculously high number of, let's say, quote unquote, celebrities who see astrologers you probably don't know about because part of the, the ethics of being an astrologer and an astrological consultant is not sharing your who your clients are or having client privilege or client privacy. And therefore, for the most part, unless somebody does Go out of their way to to you know endorse or mention you publicly. We're not going to know the vast majority of like which astrologers have consulted with which clients, and it's mm -hmm. not really even something that astrologers necessarily like talk to amongst each other. So while we know that Stephen Forrest has seen clients like Robert Downey Jr. or Sting who have chosen to mention that they've seen Stephen Forrest publicly just of their own their own volition. You know, Stevens probably is one of the bigger astrologers. Has probably seen a lot of other really famous clients that we'll never know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure there are many famous people who do consult astrology that we wouldn't know. So it's really only these scattered ones here and there that talk about it. Um, there was one that I found when I was preparing chart examples for the last conference was um, Tori Amos. I was surprised actually when I was looking through one of her biographies that she mentioned. Um, kind of in passing, but still she mentioned very clearly that she had seen an astrologer and they said such and such about her chart. And I think she actually did mention the astrologer, but I can't remember who it is now and I don't have the book on hand at the moment. Um, but so I was like excited. You know, it's always exciting as an astrologer or a person just studying astrology to to find those randomly in your daily life. Right. Yeah, definitely. And it's like occasionally you come across it. And I'm spacing out on a bunch of them. I mean, one that came up recently in the last episode I forgot about was J.K. Rowling, who is not a client, but evidently they're at an auction a few years back. Some woman auctioned off like a handwritten report, astrological report that she said that J.K. Rowling had done for her child when the child was like really young or first born or something like that, which indicated that. Before J.K. Rowling, who's the author of the Harry Potter books, before she found success writing the Harry Potter books, that she had actually done some time as a as an astrologer or had practiced astrology. It seemed like on the side for some period of time. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, but it's not something since she's become bigger. As far as I know, it's not something she talks about a lot or highlights a lot, probably because it might have negative repercussions in terms of how some of her works are perceived, or some people might have find offense to that or something like that. Sure. So that's one. Um, another one that came to mind, I mean, the most famous 
instance of like a celebrity who's consulted with astrologers, I think, as I've talked about on a past episode, is is going to have to be undoubtedly Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, and as I talked about in that episode, part of the issue was that um, him and his wife Nancy had been consulting with astrologers for years. And if you read some of his early biographies, he actually refers to this relatively openly. Um, and there was a couple of astrologers that he considered to be actual friends. But then when it came out in the 1980s, when the story broke that he had been seeing astrologers and that they'd been using astrology partially in order to um, dictate his calendar and like schedule certain things, when that story broke in the late 1980s, part of the, the there was a bit of a cover up or part of the damage control that happened is they just sort of blamed it all on Nancy and said that it was Nancy's infatuation with astrology because she was so worried about something bad happening to her husband after the first assassination attempt or after the assassination attempt and so that was the damage control was that you know Ronald Reagan himself doesn't really believe in astrology but he was just um humoring or, or something his wife but in reality if like you look back at his history it becomes clear that he probably was much more interested in astrology and had more personal belief in it than they would have admitted at the time Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely one of the bigger ones. And I always feel like there's probably people like that who, you know, other people involved with politics or involved with show business or, you know, different things who probably use astrology or have an astrologer, but, you know, we just don't hear about it most of the time. Yeah. I mean, there was this one, I'm spacing out his name, but there was one Nobel Prize winner who came out as endorsing astrology at one point, but then. It wasn't necessarily something that astrologers were getting on board with because he also turned out to be like an AIDS denialist or something at the time as as well. That's bad so, company. <laughs> yeah, so it's not really <laughs> good company to keep um, necessarily, but occasionally you'll run over, you'll run across like weird ones like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, but those are the the few that come to mind really quickly for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. that's that's about it, I think, too. Yeah. Uh, if anybody else knows of any other really good ones, because there's also a distinction between, you know, astrologers or, or let's say celebrities that know their sun sign and like that resonates with them, and they've mentioned that publicly. Right. Of which there's been a bunch. I mean, like like Beyonce has talked about being a Virgo, like Rihanna has mentioned it. Um, a lot of the different celebrities like that. I think uh, Drake, the rapper, just like named his his recent album after his sun sign, which is Scorpio. Um, so there's a bunch of things like that, but that there's a distinction between that versus, you know, celebrities that have actually consulted with a professional astrologer or actually have some more advanced astrological knowledge, where it's a little bit more rare and we know a little bit less about that because it's more of a private thing versus just people who know about their sun sign or have endorsed that for whatever reason. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. So if anybody knows of any other good examples, definitely let us know. So that's the first question. Second question from um, Astro Magdillon, it, which is from Twitter at SoulXII Astro. She says, um, How to calculate a birth chart by hand? It was basically her question. She actually, it was a sort of very brief question, but it was basically how to calculate a chart by hand. She said that she knew that it's required for one of the NCGR tests, so was curious how to go about do, doing that or starting to learn that. And this is a one I can answer relatively quickly. There's a book that I would recommend. It's titled Simply Math, A Comprehensive Guide to Easy and Accurate Chart Calculation, and you can find it on Amazon. So this is the book when I went to Kepler over a decade ago. In the second year, you had to learn chart calculation, how to calculate a, a chart by hand. And that was the book where I think originally it was like two students of Kepler College ended up writing it as part of their like final project. And then the book was so good that they ended up publishing it and um, it became the standard textbook at Kepler for learning how to read your chart or learning how to calculate your chart. So I'd recommend getting that book. That's not going to be the only book you need because you also actually will end up needing three or four, I think, other reference books in order to actually calculate the chart. Like you're going to need an ephemeris, you're going to need a time zone atlas and like a few other things like that. You might need like a table of houses if you want to calculate the ascendant degree in the midheaven and the intermediate house cusps and other things like that if you're using quadrant houses. 
So there's actually several books that you end up needing, but the Simply Math book is the starting point. And if you get that book, it'll tell you everything else you need and it'll walk you through all the steps in how to calculate your chart by hand. And it's actually not something that's, it's on the one hand, it's both kind of complicated because there's a lot of steps involved. Um, so I don't want to make it sound easy because it's not super, super easy. However, once you really get into it, it is actually doable. And when I was doing this through Kepler, I did get to the point where after, I don't know, like a week or two of going through the steps, I could accurately calculate charts by hand. And I did calculate a few charts by hand. Um, unfortunately, I learned how to do that and then took a break, I think, from Kepler and came back and tried to take the test a few months later and had promptly just forgotten all of the steps. So I think I failed the test, the chart calculation test at Kepler, even though a few months earlier I had successfully figured out how to calculate charts by hand. But nonetheless, it is possible and it's an interesting and somewhat useful skill to use because you actually understand the astronomy better when you start learning how to calculate it by hand. So it's a good kind of useful thing to, to know if you want to get deep into your studies of astrology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you, I don't have, have too much to add. No, I mean, I, you know, when I started, I think it, it was so common for people when they started before there was so much astrology software available that it was required to know how to calculate by hand just to do anything with charts. And so there's like a, you know, at least one or two generations of older astrologers who had at least at some point been doing that um, out of necessity. But, you know, if you got in more recently, then there's always been software from the beginning. So, you know, or even, you know, free things online like astro.com. So, um, you know, it's it's a little bit, I can see the value of it, especially like you said, in terms of visualizing what it all means astronomically. But it's kind of a hard sell, I think, at least to a lot of people, myself included, to, you know, when you get started and everything's right there for you to feel like you need to go back and do that. Um, so, although I can definitely see the value in it, but I haven't so far. Sure. Yeah. It's. I remember, I know there's sometimes some tension with some of the older astrologers who are annoyed that none of the, the younger astrologers know how to calculate a chart by hand mm -hmm. because they feel like that's a really integral component to for them, but for it was an integral component in terms of learning astrology and becoming a competent astrologer was like understanding or at least having some basic understanding of the astronomy. Right. Whereas I've I have i heard it's not very common because like most of the astrologers, older astrologers don't care and they're just as happy as anybody else at this point to be able to just enter the data and calculate the chart and move directly to the interpretive. Uh, sort of side of things, since that's really the side of everything that astrologers are the most concerned about, um, and and have always been the most focused on is you know what you do with the astronomy. Right. But it, you know I have seen some comments over the years that it makes there's some people concerned that it makes people astrologers now just like advanced computer users or something like that rather than knowing. And there is a little bit more of a disconnect now more than there has ever been of astrologers not necessarily understanding or knowing the astronomy underlying things and that could be problematic in the in the long term so it is probably a good skill to learn at at some point even if you don't end up using it like regularly to cal calculate charts right yeah i could see that for sure too sure all right so i think that's it for that question i get that a lot so i thought it would be a good one to answer briefly since all i have to do is refer to that one book which will tell you everything you need to know about the subject. All right, so that's that question. Uh, moving on to question three. This is by Andrew B. Watt on Twitter, at Andrew B. Watt. So he says, there's been lots of discussion recently about writing horoscopes, but you never said how to set up a chart to write horoscopes. So what is the procedure for setting a chart up to write a set of horoscopes? So what I've been doing over the past few months in my approach, and, and from what I understand of other astrologers' approach, this is relatively standard, is I've just been using the animate feature on Solar Fire. I turn the chart so that whatever the sun sign or the rising sign is that I'm talking about, I put that on the cusp of the first house. Um, I'm we're just using whole sign houses. So if I'm doing like a chart for the horoscope for let's say uh, Sagittarius and Sagittarius rising, I'll just turn the chart so that the ascendant is in Sagittarius. I'll look at um, the chart from that perspective, just imagining I'm looking at a chart using whole sign houses with Sagittarius rising, 
and then you put the transits in relative to where they are for Sagittarius rising. So we know if a person has Sagittarius rising that um, right now, for example, Saturn is going through Capricorn, and that's the second sign relative to Sagittarius. So that would be their second whole sign house. So then we interpret it basically as going through their second house, or what Mercury is about to go into Libra or something. I guess Mercury's in Virgo right now today. We're at the last tail end of the Kazemi. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be the what third house. I know. I'm sorry. I'm spacing things out. It would for, be the eleventh house. For Sag, you mean? Yeah, for rising. Sag rising. Oh yeah, it would be in the tenth, moving into the eleventh. Right, Virgo going into Libra. Mm -hmm. So you would interpret that as like their tenth whole sign house versus their eleventh house, and some of the significations associated with that. So it's basically just doing. For me, it's doing whole sign houses relative to the rising sign, and I'm encouraging people to primarily. Because that's one of the things that's nice, I think, about writing horoscopes in the early 21st century at this stage is that it's so easy to calculate your birth chart at this point online for free, and it's it's becoming more and more mainstream, and, and it's becoming more and more common knowledge that you have more than a sun sign, but people are starting to know that you should look at your sun, moon, and rising sign that I can tell people that you should primarily look at this relative to your rising sign. And if you don't know what your rising sign is, then go to astro.com and look it up, then come back and look at the correct horoscope. So from my perspective, it's kind of an easy transition doing that since I already use whole sign houses doing my, my basic birth chart delineations. So I'm just applying that to you know, a person's horoscope, um, looking at their transits through their houses but otherwise not knowing any other natal positions about their chart aside from the rising sign. And that's that's pretty much it. Right. Yeah, just basically advancing. If you have an animate feature or you can just pull up separate charts, just advancing what the transits will be through the entire month, which for some things, it'll be the same the whole month, like the Saturn transit in Capricorn that's going to be the same the whole month. And you can look for whether you know it's a month where it's stations or something like that. And puts extra emphasis on whatever house that would be relative to the rising sign. But for other things that are more quick moving, like Mercury or the Sun, um, or lunations like new moons and full moons, you just go through the entire month and see how far those planets get and what dates they um, they switch signs and things like that. Um, and then you can just use those as markers for um, kind of um, more emphasis on those particular areas of life during those parts of the month. Right, exactly. Um, and for those watching the video version, here's a little graphic that Paula actually just made me for this month's set of horoscopes, which I'm about to record. This is the one for Aries and Aries Rising, where it shows basically the transits this month and how far and what parts of the zodiac the planets will be moving through over the course of October of 2018. So it shows that there's going to be a new moon in Libra in the seventh house for those with Aries rising. There's going to be a full moon in Taurus in their second house. Venus is going to uh, go retrograde in Scorpio. Mercury is going to pass from Virgo through Libra and move most of the way through Scorpio over the course of the month. And so you're basically just looking at what houses, for the most part, those planets are going to be transiting through relative to each rising sign. And that's that's really the core of it. I mean, there's some other things that you could look at about you know what the exact aspects are that month. If there's any, um, especially major hard aspects between planets, but for the most part, this is it. Just looking at transits through whole sign houses relative to each rising sign. Mm -hmm. I really hope that the rising sign piece will catch on more with people, more popularly. You know the mm -hmm. way that most people know their sun signs. I hope more and more people um, understand and look up what their rising signs are. I was actually just getting a haircut a, a few hours ago. And um, the hairdresser next to me, they had a, a piece of paper taped to the mirror that said, do you identify with your zodiac sign? <laughs> Which made me laugh because, of course, and my hair person knows that I'm an astrologer. And I told her that I really wanted to add like another note underneath it. <laughs> and I was like, can I say, but and if you don't, <laughs> do you identify and know what your moon and rising signs are? <laughs> and I did not get to add the note. But anyway, um, you know, I hope that that becomes more common because I think a lot of people who 
Some people identify more with their sun signs, but if people don't, they usually really will with their rising or moon signs or both. And that can make all the difference in people kind of understanding that astrology works versus blowing it off. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do think it's becoming more common. I mean, seeing the amount of younger people, especially on Twitter, who know their sun, moon, and rising, it's really especially over the past year or two, it's really changed my perspective and realized there's been like a generational shift over the course of the past decade or two. Cause like when you and I got into astrology in the for me it was starting in the late nineties, early two thousands, and for you it was like early two thousands as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Astro.com, it was still a relatively recent website that just started offering a lot of that stuff starting in the late nineties. So the ability just historically speaking to to get your chart calculated accurately and for free on a website, you know, is something that was new for us in our generation when we were just starting to learn it when we were a little bit younger, like in our 20s. But for a lot of people, like they're growing up where that's already been established for a decade or two now. And it's something that a lot of people are doing. So it's much easier and more common to have somebody mention that to you than it might have been in our time. Yeah, definitely. And I hope that just keeps spreading from, you know, people who are already involved with astrology to some degree to like more of a a popular knowledge that that's a thing. Yeah, and I, well and it's also easier cuz I see a lot more cuz it's moved from horoscopes just being in like newspapers to people mainly reading them and consuming them online through like blogs or now videos right. and things like that and the astrologers, the practicing astrologers that are doing it want to move more towards interpreting it relative to the rising sign because that's how they would interpret it if they're reading an actual birth chart and so they're dropping references more to using the ascendant and i think that's partially what's changing things as well is the astrologers have more freedom to say you know you can look at this relative to your sun sign or your rising sign your moon sign or what have you yeah that's a good point people have more space to say whatever they want to say about it yeah there's less constraints mhm all right, so that's basically the short answer to that question. Um, so I think that's good. There's one more question from Twitter. So it's from Ryan W. Murphy at Weights and Means. He says, I hear a lot of references to quote unquote, if a given planet is prominent in your chart, but I never feel like I understand what that means. Could you elaborate or explain? Um, and you thought this was kind of tied into another question we got from Twitter. Which was how important slash accurate are asteroids in reading a birth chart, which is not that connected, but sort of indirectly connected. Right. Yeah. So I mean, if a plan if a given planet is prominent in your chart, I mean, usually what that means is either it's um, placed very prominently, either say like right on the ascendant, um, which is one of the most prominent places. Um, a planet can be in the chart like near the asc actual ascendant degree. Um, or if it is, there's a bunch of different ways because I think that's a general term, um, prominent. And I think that's why there can be confusion over what it means exactly because there's not one technical definition. But I think some of it's placement. So right on the ascendant or say perhaps in the 10th house because that's the most public area of the chart. Um, also, if it's your ascendant ruler, if the planet is ruling your ascendant, that's a prominent placement. If it's in a major hard aspect to your ascendant ruler, that would be a way that it's prominent. Um, and I feel like I'm blanking on the last thing I was going to say, but some of those are like just the most prominent places it can be in a chart, just location-wise. Um, oh, I just remembered. The other thing is like if you say if you have a stellium, like a bunch of different planets in one sign, then a planet ruling that sign would be particularly important for you. I wouldn't say necessarily prominent in terms of placed because that's a different thing, but it would be particularly important because it would be the ruler of many different planets in your chart. Right. Yeah. Uh, which sort of then almost leads back to the more modern concept of a final dispositor because oftentimes if somebody has a stellium that's ruled by a single planet, and it all ends up going back to that planet and sometimes it stops there. If that planet isn't then, if for example, it's in its own sign and it's therefore not ruled by any other planets, then it sort of becomes the quote unquote like final dispositor of the chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so mean, go ahead. The, I mean, the answer to the question is that there's a, there's a number of different ways that a planet can be prominent in a chart. Right. Um, and especially in Hellenistic astrology, there's a whole sort of checklist of different ones. And, and that's 
something that's interesting, Demetra George, we just got her book. Um, she's finalizing right now and doing proofing for, and and you're going to be doing some of the proofing for that next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to write the foreword right now, but we've been reading through it. And it's just this really amazing treatment of ancient astrology, except she's integrated this workbook component so that it's kind of like her second book, Astrology for Yourself, where she has um, sort of worksheets where you can go through and do this checklist of all the different things. And some of the things she does a really good job of is talking about different ways that planets can be prominent from the perspective of traditional astrology. Um, so yeah, one of those that you were mentioning is angularity. So one of the basic premises is that angular planets are more prominent than planets that are either succedent or are cadent. And the two most angular houses are the, the first house and the tenth house. Mm-hmm. So that's like one type of prominence. Another type of prominence can be like um, planetary dignity. So planets that are well placed in a chart that are going to um, express their significations in a way that's most natural to them. So that's like planets that are in their own sign or sometimes planets in their exaltations. Um, and that then gets tied into what you were talking about with stelliums, where stelliums can indicate a concentration of um, energy on a specific sign or sometimes a specific house so that that house stands out more in that person's chart than it might for somebody else. So mm-hmm. one of the famous examples of that that you showed me that I ended up integrating into my book was that children's um, book author. What was her name again? Mm-hmm. Was it Judy Bloom? are you talking about? Yeah, Judy Bloom that has like a stellium of planets in the fifth house. Mm-hmm. So we, we would just think then that for some reason, if we're looking at this person's chart, there's a greater emphasis on the topic of children in this person's life, and that ended up being true in a very interesting way. Right. Because yeah. what she wrote, like 30 children's books or something like that. Yeah, right? something like that. Yeah, like she's really well known and has like a zillion books. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, another way for pro- relative prominence can be your sect light. So like if you're born during the day versus at night, obviously that's only the sun and moon, not considering the rest of the planets. But um you know, your sect light can be more prominent. And so that's why sometimes someone will seem more like their moon sign or identify more with their moon sign than their sun sign. So that can be a certain way in which that could be more prominent than otherwise, as well as the ruler of that sign. Um, and, And that's probably like one of those where you would otherwise overlook it unless it was prominent in a different way. But that can be like an extra way that that can be prominent is the ruler, ruling planet of the sect light. Okay. Um, yeah, the ruling planet. And that was actually traditionally one of the. Oh, there's the delirium. Uh, All right, I have to step out. I'll be right back. Okay. So continue with your thought. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, there's a package that Chris is uh, receiving that he needs to sign for <laughs> for a moment. Um, yeah, so the ruling planet of the sect light is otherwise, if it's not locationally prominent, um, that can give an extra emphasis that you wouldn't expect otherwise to some like seemingly random planet in your chart. Um, and sometimes people have looked up, say, like the ruler of their sun sign in that respect, and you know realized that as a sort of intermediate step that 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 could be more important. But it actually can also be the ruler of the moon sign as well um, if you were born. When the um, moon was the the um, luminary that was visible versus the sun, so um, yeah, I mean, I think prominence wise, most people are usually talking more about location. So planets in the first house, planets in the tenth house, um, or planets like conjunct your ascendant ruler. I feel like those several are are some of the m- most common ways that people are thinking about when they say prominence. Um, yeah, and that. Kind of, um, I hope Chris doesn't have any other points about this because that kind of segues into the next point about asteroids because that's actually the reason why I was thinking about tying those two questions together, um, which was how important slash accurate are asteroids in reading a birth chart, um, was that usually when people do use asteroids and they don't kind of go crazy with them, they usually talk about them Um, with respect to if they're connected to something prominent, something else prominent in the chart. And so, for instance, if there's an asteroid conjunct the ascendant ruler or on an angle, so near the ascendant degree itself, near the midheaven degree, near the IC, near the descendant, things like that, 
Um, can you hear me now? Are you are you back on? I am back. Hilariously, okay. we knew there was going to be a delivery today, but hilariously, that wasn't even the delivery I was waiting for. Oh, no. It was actually a delivery of some t-shirts. <laughs> so good. My, my, oh, that, my, oh, that's a good my, one. My yeah. Ophi- Ophiuchus is not a sign shirt <laughs> showed up in the mail, as well as my what is your sun moon rising sign shirt? Oh, nice. Yeah, I like that Ophiuchus one. Strikingly um, relevant to our previous question. <laughs> right, right. So we may get another interruption because that was actually not the one he was waiting for. Um, yeah. I did just move on for a second, unless you have more things about the prominence. I started to talk about the asteroid connection. Do you have more to say about the prominence in general? Um, no, just there's a bunch of different ways that pla- there's a few different ways that planets can be prominent. There's one other that we didn't touch on, which is like making a heliacal rising mm. is is a major traditional one, and that's one right. that Demetra spends some time on in her book. So when that book comes out here pretty soon in the next few months, it'll be a really good one to get a a, a hold of if you're curious about this topic. Yeah, definitely. So I mean. I think the the general answer is there's a number of different ways. It's not just one thing that people are talking about when they say a planet is prominent, but it's also not like everything in your chart. So there maybe be like several things that would make different planets prominent, but not all of them. Definitely. Yeah. So and and but with asteroids, I mean, I I think asteroids are something that I've seen them work, but it's not that important to me to the extent that it's like there's a lot of minor things that I think. Oh, that's funny. I, the, I can the, keep talking about asteroids. All right, go ahead. <laughs> okay, that's hopefully the other delivery. Um, so asteroids are actually kind of a thing that I've gone through a, a funny journey around because when I first encountered them, I thought it was really fun just because they have such specific meanings, some of them, and so it was a way to kind of like look up lots of different things and see whether they seem true for you, whether those particular topics were really, you know, important for you. But I think that's usually there is kind of a journey that people go through with asteroids more or less, which is um, because there's so many. And so, you know, for, so for some people, they'll use just like the first several ones that were discovered, um, like I think Juno and Cirrus and then um, Vesta and things like that. Um, there's a few major ones that some people use. Um, But if you actually look at asteroids, there's just a zillion of them. And some of them are named for personal names. Some of them are city names. Some of them are mythological um, figures. Um, There's a lot of those. There's some that, I don't know, there's a lot of random ones too. And so um, on the one hand, they can be fun to play with. But on the other hand, you can get really sidetracked too. And so I think the proper way to use asteroids, in my humble opinion, is you know to learn everything else first because um, there's so many other more major considerations for how to judge different areas of um, a person's life. And so they're like they're kind of like sprinkles. So you can like add a few sprinkles at the end. Again, this is my approach, but um, you know, but they're not like the main you know food food substance. It's just a little extra. Um, now, that's not to say I don't want to like, I, I guess on the flip side, I don't want to say that they can't show. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I need to hold on one second. Let Chris back in. OK, was that All the right. one you were waiting for? What do you say? Was that the package you were waiting for? Yeah. So. I uh, ordered this new camera in order to do. I'm trying to get more into be able to do live streaming with the podcast and the um, YouTube channel. So the the camera actually just arrived, which we were waiting for. And we knew as soon as we started recording, it's like Murphy's Law or something that it would of course arrive right then. Right. And then of course I locked myself out <laughs> trying to get back in. <laughs> yeah. So sorry for the interruption, but hopefully we won't get any more deliveries <laughs> in the next while. Right. All right. So where did you you answer that question extensively? <laughs> I, or what did you say about full, asteroids? I wasn't fully done. Um, so basically, I was saying, um, you know, that you can you can get excited about them for a little bit. I think there's like often a little journey that some sometimes people go through where it's like really fun for a little bit because there's so many of them and they have such specific you know names or or meanings. Um, 
But in the end, I was just, as I just let you in right before that, I was comparing them to sprinkles, like on a cupcake, where, right. you know, you can add some at the end, but like, that's not the main substance of what's going on. And yeah. I mean, some people really like sprinkles, though. So I feel like that's a dangerous <laughs> analogy. Like, there's somebody <laughs> you that could might not... sit there and eat a bag of sprinkles, but it wouldn't ultimately be substantially satisfying to your hunger. <laughs> right. You would, you couldn't like eat that in a desert and survive. Right. I mean, so I was just about to say on the flip side. So that's my my general impression is that you know you should definitely learn the major pieces first like and really thoroughly because that's really going to say most of everything about what's going on in someone's chart and someone's life in different areas of their life um and like know those really well first before you kind of get a little sidetracked with the asteroids but that's not to say that they can't mean things um and they can't be like interesting additions and um you know i know that some people i was saying earlier that some people use like a handful of the um earliest ones like juno and vesta and cirrus and things like that um and so i think you could also do that like pick a few that kind of have major mythological um meanings and 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 then just if you look at them consistently enough then i think you can do something potentially useful with them um and I guess I should say here too that one of the reasons why I don't want to get too like um, you know dismissive of asteroids because I do know that one of the major reasons that some people initially got into them and are still into them is that they brought more um, female mythological characters in into the chart, um, whereas there were like a lot of um, planets named for for male figures and not as many for women. Right. So, yeah, although there was a whole issue there with the like we don't know if Saturn was supposed to be feminine originally and if it was in Dorotheus then it might have been at least split theoretically 50-50 in the beginning. Right. With yeah. the tradition with the traditional 7. Right. And I just wanted to kind of throw that in there because I know that that's kind of um a less superficial reason that some people find them important. Um so for me, the reason why those two questions were tied into each other is because um, uh, the way some people who use asteroids regularly um, counsel to use them, and I kind of agree, is um, just look at ones that are really prominently placed in the chart. So on the ascendant, descendant, midheaven, I see, conjunct the ascendant ruler, uh, maybe conjunct the sun or moon, things like that, and like closely um, in degree. So I think personally that that's kind of the way to go. Um, I still think they can be fun and sometimes just like make me laugh. Like some of the asteroids really make me laugh. But um, I know, for instance, someone who has had a longstanding alcohol problem and the asteroid beer is very closely conjunct their midheaven degree. Um, and, you know, there's just stuff like that where they make me laugh in ways that the planets don't. <laughs> but Right. <laughs> I mean, to me, that, though, is the reason why I've never use them that much because it's almost just like yeah that's entertaining but it's not like a crucial um piece to me there's so much more important stuff to prioritize and it can you can spend so much time on the super important stuff that gets to like really core things about the person's life that getting to this sort of garnish or the sprinkles of the asteroids to me isn't that important and therefore i've never prioritized a lot or i've never found the need to prioritize a lot in chart stuff and i feel like there's a lot of things in astrology where you could like make a whole thing about that and like make that your focal point but if you do so oftentimes it's at the de to the detriment of some of the more important fundamentals i definitely agree yeah and i think it's important to thoroughly know the everything else first um or at least prioritize that more in in reading a chart um, and usually, you know, unless it's something really specific, like a personal name, like I know sometimes people who work with asteroids will be like, oh, look, this person has a longtime partner or spouse with this name. And there's like a really similarly named asteroid that's like on their descendant or something like that. And, you know, that can add something specific that you wouldn't have seen otherwise, but it's not necessarily crucial. Like I said, it just kind of, they usually make me laugh more than, you know, are like essential. Um and also, even in the ones that will show you something, like like in the um, example I was mentioning, you know, with beer and the midheaven, there's almost always something more primary in the chart that will point to the same issue. 
So right, like it's a, not to say like that I wouldn't Neptune have- Neptune theme or something like that. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, they're not, in my opinion, essential. Um, they can be fun to play with when you've kind of mastered a bunch of other stuff, I would say. Sure. So if somebody was, I do want to say, if somebody did want to figure out a way to integrate them or wanted to find like the best way to approach it, Demetra tries to deal with this question in her book that came out about 10 years ago called Astrology and the Authentic Self, where it's kind of an attempt to, to bridge and to synthesize modern and traditional astrology. But one of the things that she does is she, she talks about how she integrates the asteroids into her practice within that context. So if you did want to, that would be where I would go to, to learn more about that. Um, it's not something that I use majorly. I, I mean, I, I don't even use Chiron at this point. And I know there's some astrologers that think that that's like a major thing. I know you're, you're one person where you do use Chiron at least regularly, right? I use Chiron more often than other asteroids or other bodies, but I use it similarly because I don't find that it jumps out in every chart. And so I only use it if it seems focal in some way, like if it's conjunct something important or if there's like another theme that it's adding another repetition to that's like sort of confirming something. Um, but I, sure. so I use it in some and not others. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, I feel like there was a lot more excitement. Like when Chiron was first discovered, that was like the next planetary body that was really discovered since Pluto. And so I think there was more excitement a few years, a few decades ago. And that was the reason why, for example, like in astro.com, it's like a default thing that appears on charts, I think. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I know a lot of astrologers like me or Austin or Kelly or other people that place like a huge amount of emphasis on asteroids because there's, there's just so much else to focus on that has greater priority and is more important in dictating things about the person's chart in their life before you get to asteroids. But I kind of feel the same way about other things like, for the most part, fixed stars, um, some subdivisions of the signs, even to some extent lots although or Arabic parts, although I do place a lot of emphasis on spirit and fortune for the purpose of the zodiac releasing timing technique. But there's just a lot of things like that um, that are sort of like minor things that sometimes I feel like astrologers get carried away by, and sometimes that can be distracting to new people that are just getting into astrology. So I would caution not to get carried away by it um, too early in your studies before getting the fundamentals down. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, just don't take it as the same level as um, the more foundational things in the chart for sure. So sprinkles. Yeah, don't don't be um, sold. Don't be be fooled by the hype because sometimes they get like hyped up or or, or somebody if that mm -hmm. where that's like their thing or their sort of pet project that will hype it, which is like kind of okay, but sometimes can be misleading for new students that don't realize that like most astrologers aren't using that thing as like the most important thing in astrology 24/7. Right. Yeah, or I guess one other way to approach it is to, you know, in addition to learning all the foundational things well is, you know, if you want to focus on that, then like do it thoroughly enough so that you know what you're talking about rather than kind of dipping in and out because then you could actually add some kind of potential new knowledge to that area of astrology, but it's usually not when people just kind of halfway look at them that they really um, get much additional kind of substance out of that. Okay, sure. Definitely. All right. So that's a good, that's probably good for that question. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. The next question was by a uh, listener named Johannes and he says, I've got another question for the Q&A. What exactly constitutes the beginning for electional astrology? For example, I want to use an election to find a new job. What is the beginning in this case? The job search, the writing of the application, the telephone call, the sending of the application, the job interview, the start of the job, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so both of us have you know, done a decent bit with elections. I mean, I would say that so it depends on the topic. Some things lend themselves more to having just like one or two more primary moments that are really important in kind of starting that venture or starting whatever that entity is versus some have more. And, and the one that he mentioned, so I guess one that I think has fewer is like getting married. And so 
there can sometimes be a discussion about whether um, signing the marriage certificate versus saying your vows and being pronounced married are like the more important moments, but there's not like six or seven moments, you know? Um, and there's there's fewer for something like that versus a job search. Like he mentioned, there are actually a number of different pieces that could be important um, in, you know, in that. And so it, this is where it's helpful to actually know some principles or at least basic principles of electional astrology, I feel, because um, something like that, it's useful to at least use the, the very basics um, for each piece of that. So I know in the past, for instance, I've paid attention to when I've sent in an application for a job. And also even when I set the interview time, if there were op different options for interview times. Um, yeah, and then, you know, I've looked at charts for when I've actually started on the first day of a job, and that seems to matter too. So, um, yeah, so I would say it depends. Um, one thing that I have said in the past um, is that Sometimes it's when you do the first thing, the very first thing, like if you're starting to write a book, it might be when you um, start a new document and write something on it and then push save. Um, that could be the beginning, like the very beginning inceptional moment versus sometimes it matters a bit more when you kind of can't take it back. Like if you're sending a letter or sending an email, um, typically when you actually press send or you put the thing in the mailbox is considered a major inceptional moment. Yeah. I mean, I always think back, I don't know if we've answered this question before on the podcast, but I always try to root it in um, Ptolemy's distinction between conception charts versus birth charts or conception versus birth, and then to take that principle and apply it to other things. So Ptolemy says, he tries to address this question of what's the difference between conception and birth, and he says that he basically says that conception and the conception chart is the chart for the gestation, which is like the eight or nine months that the of the pregnancy itself and the sort of success or failure of the pre pregnancy in some instances. Versus the birth chart itself is truly the the beginning of the life and the the success or failure or everything that comes from that point forward once the individual is born and starts their life as a sort of independent entity from the mother. So I try to think about it in that context as well. Like you were just talking about, you know, um, writing a book and like starting to write the book is like an, an electional chart, but it's kind of like a conception chart for the book where you first start that Word document and that chart itself might tell you the, you know, how the book writing process itself is going to go, but the book itself isn't officially born until it's published and is like officially available that day. Um, so the the trick though or the sort of insider pro tip electional astrologer thing is that eventually you realize that very rarely is there just like one defining moment or there's not always one defining moment but instead many things are like a series of successive moments of importance and that in reality what we end up doing in practice oftentimes is having a variety of different electional charts available for those different important moments in that sequence of like initiating or starting something. So like doing an electional chart for starting to write your book, which is actually what I did. It wasn't a very good electional chart. And I actually look back and I kind of laugh at that now in retrospect, because I I think I needed to start, I wanted to start it while Virgo was while Mercury was still in Virgo back in like 2006, but I only had a few days left to do that. So I think I started it like as soon as I could, but it was at like sunrise back in September of 2006. And there's some other things that are not great about the chart because I was still very new to electional astrology, but I did start a chart for that. And then there was a separate chart for like when the book was published. Um, yeah, but there's other things like that where there might be some in-between stages as well that you might have other electional charts for. Right. Yeah, for sure. And that's kind of why, I mean, even though um, some kind of endeavors uh, lend themselves more to a number of moments versus like, you know, two to three moments or something. Um, it's still just useful to learn some of these principles because say you're going to pay someone to do an election, usually they'll just do it for the most important one to two things, um, right. but not like seven or eight, you know? And so 
But if you learn these principles yourself, then you can kind of use them in your day-to-day -day life, you know, and not, yeah. And so you can still kind of make the best charts possible for some of those in-between um, pieces. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we outline, you know, at least four electional charts each month on our pot on the Auspicious Elections podcast that we do for patrons on the five and ten dollar tier through our page on Patreon. because uh, that's what we're doing ourselves each month is like we're using different electional charts for starting different things or for different phases of things that we're initiating during the course of it um, each month. And sometimes that's like the success of things we're doing in a single project. Um, whether it's you know writing a book or like la launching a website is a tough one because there's a little ambiguity there about when a website happens and that's an issue I have with like finding the chart for the astrology podcast is that I know a few different important moments like when I first discovered and bought the domain name theastrologypodcast.com when I first bought uh, when I first um, bought the website for it and uploaded the first files to the website. Uh, there's the moment when I like started recording the first podcast. Like with this one, we were trying to shoot for Capricorn Rising to start recording this podcast today, and we wanted to avoid Aquarius Rising because it was going to put Mars like right in the first house or right on the ascendant. So we sped things up and made sure we started before Aquarius Rising. But then there'll be a separate chart for when I actually release and publish this podcast online, which is probably the actual chart for the, the episode itself. Um, yeah, so it's it's a matter of sometimes being aware of the different important symbolic moments of conception or birth and trying to as much as you can cover cover all of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes also just think through the logic of like what might be the most important things in order to make that endeavor like an individual entity, like you were saying with the conception versus birth. So, for instance, that's. Um, that's why I prioritize like pushing send on an email. You know, I mean, you can try and write it and also send it uh, if it's an important, you know, communication under the same rising sign. But I prioritize the sending of a letter or an email or something because that's when it's out in the world and you, you know, on its own. And similarly, when people get married, um, even though usually it's p totally possible to start the ceremony and have the vows under the same rising sign, and most people do. Um, if that's not possible for whatever reason, I prioritize the moment of saying the vows and um, being pronounced married because say someone like walks out in the middle of the ceremony, it doesn't happen very often, but it could happen, they wouldn't be married, you know? Right. So um, so that the prior to that particular moment, they don't exist as a, as a married couple, whereas after that moment they do, even though the start of the ceremony is still important, you know, as a gathering. So um, just kind of thinking through like maybe the logic of each particular project and what makes the most sense in terms of you know um, declaring it a thing. Yeah, and it's the the point of no return is the one ideally that you're searching for. Mm -hmm. um, although sometimes that can be tricky to establish, but because it, it's it's the point of no return, but it's also the one that's the most symbolically significant. Right. So symbolically significant is the most important thing. Under the premise that there's moments in time that have symbol symbolic importance um, in terms of a person's overall life narrative, and establishing the most symbolically significant moment. So, so there's one, for example, like departing for trips. We've played with this a lot because sometimes we'll we'll both try to like book our plane tickets under a decent election, but that's not really the one we're we're the most focused on because that's more like the conception. But most of the time when we've left for like astrology conferences, we'll really focus on um, this is one I got from my friend Scott Silverman years ago, where he said that he always elected his charts for when he sort of locked his door and left the front door of his house in order to finally begin his journey for that specific trip. And that's always worked out relatively well for us, I think. Yeah, definitely. And we've tracked a lot of those at this point. Um, and you can usually see how the trip worked out based on the chart for for when you're leaving the the house. Because it is when you're leaving for the whole journey. Because separately, you know, if you're going on a flight, for instance, there's a certain point where the flight takes off. But right. you know, that's not necessarily your whole journey because it's like part of the journey that you started when you left home. Because you're not intending to take all your luggage and go to the grocery store and come back. You know, it's like that's the symbolic start of the journey. 
Yeah, when you leave your your house for mm -hmm. the final time versus I mean you could because you could argue that that's the point of no return when the plane takes off and it's out of your hands, but that's an instance where I think the symbolic significance of you leaving your home and sort of like locking your door for the final time is more important in that instance even though theoretically yeah, you could come back home or something like that, but Yeah, right, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and if you test these things for long enough, that's why it's useful to just like write down, even if it's not that important at the time, write down when you do certain things and then look at the chart later and see how that worked out. So see how a trip worked out when you write down the time for when you left your home and different things like that. And then it usually matches the chart quite well. So you can kind of watch it, you know, kind of be um, confirmed that that is in fact the proper moment. Yeah, and that's actually it's something I recommend in my professional astrologer course that I launched this month, but I'll, I'll reiterate it here right now. Everyone needs to, you know, I would recommend you doing it in Solar Fire because that's the easiest way to organize it into different folders, but you can also do it on astro.com or wherever you save charts. Start um, a database and start compiling charts as early in your astrological studies as you can of different times when both electional times when you started different things. Um, so when you started a trip or when you got married or even in ones that you've observed, like when you, you were at a wedding and you saw your friend get married, you write down the time, save that chart, um, but also other important events in your life, like when you met somebody for the first time, um, when you started a job, other things like that. Start saving as many of those charts as you can, as frequently as you can for important events or semi-important or even events that you don't think are important at the time, but they still represent a new development in your life because you may turn around years later and find out that that event was hugely important. And that becomes your core material for, for astrological research because your own life events and own life story will always end up being the most important material that you have to draw on in developing your, your understanding as an astrologer. But it only works if you pay attention to and start documenting things relatively early on. And the, the best way to do that is by having exact time charts for important events. Yeah, I definitely agree. I don't have too much more to add. I mean, you'll talk to client chart clients about their charts or friends or you know, family, but um, they'll only tell you some things about their life um, or whatever can be fit into, you know, an hour, hour and a half, um, versus you have you know, 24-7 material that you can always try to observe and, and use as research charts. Right, definitely. Um, so yeah, so we both use Solar Fire and and I always forget to mention it and people then always email at me about it. So we use Solar Fire and the discount, the the promo code for that is AP15 if you want to get the, I think it's like a 10 or 15% discount when you buy the program through Astrolabe, which is the company that sells it in the US uh, at alib.com. All right, so I think that's it for that mm -hmm. chart. Um, we did have a, like a sub question, which I don't know. Do you have an answer to this? So Arthur uh, asks, are there any hilarious stories of unforeseen consequences from electing a chart poorly? And I know I have some, but I can't remember any offhand. Did you have one that you remembered? I just had one thing that was kind of like that. I think I may have um, talked about it on the electional podcast, but I don't think anyway that I've talked about it on the um, regular podcast before. So. Mm -hmm. It was before I learned electional principles, really. Uh, I would just knew it was a thing, but I hadn't really learned how to do elections yet. And and so it was actually early on when um, you and I had started talking, actually, and I rem had remembered that you told me that you can't elect everything. Sometimes you just have to do stuff when you need to do it, which I think is still true <laughs> with some caveats. So... Um, so I learned some caveats from that experience, which was I needed to list my room for rent. I was moving out of Boulder um, to Denver, and I had signed a lease that I was breaking, so I needed to um, list it on Craigslist. And and so I was thinking that at the moment, I was like, all right, well, uh, sometimes you just have to do things when <laughs> when you need to do them. And so I put it on Craigslist. And then I think I had some exchange with you later on and you were like, you did that just now? <laughs> and, and the reason why right, was- I'm probably like looking at the chart at that moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think I had software back then. And I was like, yeah, why? <laughs> and you were like, I mean, and I said, you said that 
Sometimes right, you're like, but you, to- you said that you could do it. You just got to do what you got to do. And I'm like, well, there's an implied <laughs> caveat there of don't do it under a terrible, terrible chart. Right, exactly. And I didn't know how to how to distinguish terrible, terrible charts at the time. It was like, you know, 10-ish years ago or something. Um, so anyway, it was hilarious, in fact, in retrospect, now that I know electional astrology, because... What happened is I had Saturn right on the ascendant in a night chart, which already is like super terrible um, because Saturn is the most challenging planet if it's an, a night chart, if the sun is already set. And so to put it in the most prominent place in a chart on the ascendant is like not what you want to do. <laughs> um, and then I think there were also like two other planets like applying fairly closely to Saturn as well. <laughs> Okay, and... so it was just like the, all the negative quality, <laughs> basically all the negative qualities that you could possibly draw out of Saturn were being emphasized as much as possible in this chart. Yes, which is in fact hilarious to look back at and be like, yeah, this is. I actually put that in my um, my last electional lecture. I put this as like a what not to do slide because it's like the antithesis of every electional principle you would like normally proactively use. <laughs> Right. So, so what and what happened is you're so, breaking the lease, you're moving, and you needed to have somebody else, you know, fulfill this or, or or sign up to become a tenant as soon as possible. Otherwise you're gonna have to pay hundreds of dollars on like a second um rental thing that you're no longer living in. Yes. And that's in fact what happened. So um and it was like otherwise a fairly desir- desirable and inexpensive room in Boulder, Colorado, which is like a nice place to live. But like for some reason I kept showing the place and like it kept just not working out. Like there were there were people that you know answered the ad, but for whatever reason, it just kept not working and not working. And so I was paying, in fact, on two apartments for like months, and I was like exhausted because I was like working almost every day in order to keep paying for these two apartments. And so I mean, the principle of making the undesirable parts of Saturn super prominent, which were you know that I was getting very very tired from overwork, which are both Saturn things. Um, and also that things were taking way longer than they should have um, right. in, in most cases. That was really the most prominent thing about it. Because it was literally like, the primary thing I need to do with this thing is make this happen as quick as possible. <laughs> yes. And you pick the chart that had was basically as far diametrically opposite to that as possible by putting like Saturn on the Ascendant in a night chart with other planets applying to hard aspects with Saturn. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like, and and that's actually a good exercise that people could do. That is a good no. I mean, because that's how to learn with astrology. Is sometimes we learn <laughs> by our mistakes, or you learn sometimes oh, by yeah. doing like the opposite of what otherwise you could re- re- what what would be recommended. Because then you can see what the worst case scenario is sometimes. So like, if you wanted to reconcile with somebody, let's say, and like make peace with somebody or form a friendship, and and instead you put like. Mars conjunct the ascendant in a day chart with the moon applying to like an opposition or a square with Mars or something like that, then you're emphasizing that divisive energy or that like pulling apart or or anger or um fighting or something like that. You're 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 emphasizing that archetype rather than the more like unity and friendship and other type archetype from Venus. So yeah, you know that's one way to go about learning. Though, just go <laughs> try to elect like the exact opposite of what you're going for. Um, but also, just being—that's one of the things that the biggest things I think that trips up modern astrologers is that it, not I shouldn't say modern, but one of the trends that we've noticed is like it doesn't seem like there there haven't there wasn't for a long time in the 20th century many books on electional astrology, and as a result of that, most modern contemporary astrologers didn't know. The basic principles of traditional electional astrology and like what you look for in a good chart or what you look for in a bad chart, because even that distinction between good and bad charts had been eradicated due to the premise that in psychological astrology there's no good or bad placements. Everyone's just has different shades of whatever and, and does their best, which is fine from a consulting standpoint, but from an electional standpoint, there is a difference between creating a chart that's optimized for what you're trying to accomplish versus you know in these instances we're talking about creating a chart that's diametrically opposite to what you're trying to accomplish or could could counteract that in some way yeah definitely and instead then people kind of try to figure it out themselves and prioritize like the psychological qualities or traits of different signs and things like that 
um, which, you know, it's not to say that those don't ever express themselves um, in an electional chart, but it's just not like the primary thing that you want to go to first. Sure. Yeah. So no, knowing some of those distinctions. So yeah, I think I think that answers the question. Um, yeah, or I actually example. really love that story, and it makes me laugh a lot. But I wouldn't go out of my way to choose it, you know. And so it's like it's tough because I, I I kind of also agree that like using really bad electional charts can be very instructive. But the thing is, you don't want to use them for things that are of much of importance at all, <laughs> you know, because they probably will go badly. So um, use them for super minor things and see how they go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I still do it occasionally just for like minor things, just to mess around and see what happens. Or sometimes, like you'll do it for for consultations, because one of the things okay. astrologers notice pretty quickly when you're consulting astrologer is sometimes if you have a bad like electional chart for a consultation, sometimes that consultation does not go well for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's made both of us kind of nervous and annoyed sometimes. Then, and when we're needing to schedule things like back to back and not having a good chart, and sometimes just having to to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Right. <laughs> sometimes you just have to do things when they're necessary. Just don't use the worst possible charts. <laughs> that is the lesson. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's not worst case scenario, but it's just like minor annoyances or problems come up, but it's manageable. And then, of course, one of the things that's always imp implicit in all of the rules that we're giving is that the natal chart of of you or the individuals involved is always sitting there somewhere or is in in our mind in terms of when we are electing things we're also thinking of that to some extent as well mm -hmm. even though we're establishing the event chart itself first as primary there's still the natal transits sometimes which can, can offset or can be different if the person's having like super good transits that day but the electional chart is not great sometimes that can help to balance things out in things at least going positively for that individual, or even if it ends up being difficult in the election, ultimately being successful for the the individual in the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. All right, so I think that's good for that question. So moving on to the next one, uh, this is from listener Marin. So she says, in terms of conferences, how do you know you when you're ready to apply to speak or hold a lecture? Do you need a specific original breakthrough in order to consider moving forward towards that? So, I mean, my recommendation for this is before um, trying to speak at conferences. So, I, this is again something I talk about in the professional course. These are the types of questions that I address in the professional course, just to uh, you know promo promote that again. Uh, I usually recommend trying to give at least a couple of talks at a local astrology group first. And that's the role that the local astrology groups still play. That's actually really crucial and important. Is there like the staging ground or like the starting point for astrologers starting to get on the lecture circuits and eventually starting to speak at conferences or or give workshops or other things like that? Is the local astrology groups of which there's usually at least one or two in any major city, if not more, um, are a great place to get some experience giving. Astrology lectures and talks, and that's the starting point. And and once you've given a couple of talks at least at a local astrology group, then you could think about you know applying to speak at a at a, like a regional astrology conference or a larger national astrology conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that too. And depending on the group, sometimes like our group, for instance, we have at times in the past. Let people do like a like a half meeting talk, so split the time up so that you don't have to come up with like a full, um, you know, seventy five minute lecture. But say you start with a twenty or thirty minute lecture or something. That's of course depending on, you know, what the group is open to. But um, that's also a nice way to just kind of dip your toe in and you know and get started when you've never done it before. Um, the next step I would say is some of the conferences will offer things called like lunchtime lectures or sometimes they'll call them different things but basically lectures during lunchtime where you're usually not paid for it but it's kind of and so it's not like you're selected kind of against everyone who's more experienced but it's a way to kind of get younger or newer um, astrologers uh, starting to integrate into speaking at conferences in a kind of lower pressure way yeah, I think some of my first lectures at uh, an NCGR conference at a major national conference were lunchtime lectures. 
Yeah, mine as well. Um, I would say beyond that, I mean, you don't have to have like a groundbreaking thing, you know, like observation. Um, I think that was part of the other part of the question. Right. You don't have to like come up with something brand new in order to start speaking because actually, you know, that's not super common um, in astrology. It's more building on what's already known and then just occasionally, you know, something groundbreaking will, you know, someone will come up with. But um, I think it helps to um, to have become interested in a particular topic more than other topics so that you can like focus on it more for a bit. And so then you have more to say about it. So it's not that you have to necessarily something say something brand new about that topic, but you do need to be like more or less well versed in that particular thing. Um, or, and, or, um, have looked at enough good example charts or gathered enough good example charts so that you have something interesting to point out about it, I guess. Right. And that's, we were talking about this today, the other day, cause this is a video that I, I want to make for the professional course, which is things to avoid or not to do in astrology lectures that sometimes we see like too frequently. And one of them is don't give an entire lecture that's only about your own chart. So it's okay occasionally like to drop or use your chart as an example, but don't um, make that like your primary example. Try to focus on other chart examples of other either case studies you've done or like celebrity chart examples or just you know whatever. But try not to make it just only about yourself or only using your your own chart as an example. Yeah, definitely. I super agree with that. It it can be kind of cringe inducing to like watch that as an audience member, especially because I think it's a newer kind of like it's it's more common when people are newer into astrology and they're just like excited about everything. And so it doesn't really stand out yet as like something that's maybe a little bit inappropriate to do. Um, but as you know, if people are listening and they've been involved with astrology for longer, it comes off as a little bit like narcissistic or like also like, oh, you so you haven't looked at anyone else's chart yet, just your own, you know? Sure. Um, so it, it's funny because it's an interesting contrast with my recommendation earlier and saying that, you know, right. really your own chart and documenting events in your life is your is always going to be your primary study tool. And it's like that's true. But you can't stay there and you run into issues of like subjective experience and subjective bias with your own life. The only reason your life is like the the best and will be your primary case study is because that's the one that you're gonna have the most control over in terms of gathering data and events in your life and being able to get like exactly time charts for every little thing. Um, but for the purposes of like presentation, you know, you want to have a variety of different examples because that's going to make your whatever conclusions you're making seem more compelling and not just based on your own subjective perception or or biases about your life or or what have you, as well as making it not just like a presentation about your own life, just in general for seventy five minutes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I would say all of those same things. So it's, you know, using um your own life experience as a constant learning tool is different. <clears throat> excuse me, and distinguish from what you're actually presenting in a lecture for the most sure. part. Sure. Sure. So um yeah, but just a, it doesn't have to be a a unique thing that like nobody's ever discovered or talked about before, but sometimes even just presenting a good, well rounded presentation of something other people have talked about before, but presenting it in in a way that's compelling or um has your own unique spin on it or has unique chart examples or um, something like that. Sometimes even just a, a very good presentation, a well-refined presentation of something that people already know about is sufficient. And, and really, when you see a lot of lectures on like the astrology circuit at major conferences, that's a lot of what you know. A fair portion of what a lot of lectures are about is topics, you know, like like secondary progressions or something. It's not like people haven't been talking about secondary progressions for like a century. But there's always new people coming into the field who don't know, you know, that Dane Rudyard gave a lecture on secondary progressions like 30 or 40 years ago or something, because they didn't see that lecture. So they're a new student of astrology and they want to learn the basics. And they go to a conference, they see secondary progressions are on the lecture circuit and they don't know anything about that. So they attend your lecture. And one of the things that it's good to do is not to assume that your audience already knows what you're talking about. But instead, try to approach the subject 
as if your audience doesn't have any idea what the background is on that topic, and then do, do the best job you can to explain it from the ground up. And that's sort of a good approach in any lecture that you give. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think implicit in part of that you know, question about needing, you know, do you need something really novel or groundbreaking is, you know, that uh, astrology in many ways is a craft and you're you're learning and building on what's been done before. And so um, I think that sometimes people view it through the eyes of like, if someone's been an astrologer for decades, like, are they going to find this interesting? But that's not always the bar because once people have learned um, you know, things for years and years have been practicing, maybe that's not who your specific audience is and just not always to gauge it based on like, do I have something brand new? Right. I mean, because part of it is that every, like I've talked about this a few times before and I emphasize it in the professional course that you've got to push yourself to make the transition to start seeing clients at some point, even if you don't feel like you're ready, because there's only so much book learning you can do and a lot of your your knowledge as an astrologer will eventually come from seeing clients because every new client you see, even though you may know how to delineate their chart, you may be able to tell them things about their chart without knowing them personally. And you're going to be able to say things about their life that are true. You're also going to learn things about them and how the placements in their chart manifest in a unique way that are going to be new pieces of information. And you're going to learn something new from having that consultation with them. So part of what's happening in astrology lectures is there's Astrologers sharing with other astrologers examples that they have found, which represent, you know, whatever that person's unique uh, manifestation of that placement was, and that then becomes like community knowledge that helps to like improve the whole community's understanding of of different types of manifestations of different placements. Yeah, definitely, I thoroughly agree. I'm really big on using lots of chart examples and and client stories or client or you know friend whoever stories in um, lectures because it really because of that very reason that you mentioned and just fleshing out um, almost I, that's kind of a, my big thing, but like almost like why it matters, like why do we care about this particular topic or um, why do we care about how this particular thing can manifest? And I think that's often. Um, really well done through specific client stories. Right. Um, so quick, that's a, a good opportunity maybe then as a, not a segue, but a um, promo. So Kelly and Austin and I just recorded the forecast, the next forecast episode yesterday, which will actually be released after this episode. But we mentioned that uh, NORWAC, the Northwest Astrological Conference, the schedule for that was just released. Um, and a bunch of us are going to be speaking at it next May. So just to give you an example of lectures, I'm giving two lectures or my two main lectures there. One of them is on sect, which is the difference between day and night charts where I'm going to, I'm going to share a bunch of examples of, you know, this is an example of somebody that has um, Saturn in the 10th house in a day chart. And this is somebody that has Saturn in the 10th house in a night chart, or this is Mars in the first house in a day chart versus a night chart or what have you. Um, and then another example, uh, chart one that I'm giving is reception as a mitigating factor in natal astrology, which is going to be another one, which is one of the experiences I've had in in seeing clients over the years and and have gathered a bunch of examples on is just how significant reception is as a mitigating factor in taking the edge off of some aspects and some placements in the chart that would otherwise be more difficult than they otherwise. Um, are, are actually manifesting in the person's life just due to reception. So some of that's a little bit of a blend between unique research and some of it's more of sort of just showing um, my own personal examples that I've found of specific techniques that are already relatively well known. Mm -hmm. What are you speaking? You're speaking there? Yeah. So um, mine's uh, benefic and malefic for the modern astrologer. Which um, should actually have a lot of crossover with some of yours, but hopefully we can distinguish them a bit. Um, yeah, so um, basically, just um, why, if someone hasn't already incorporated um, the the benefic and malefic distinction, um, or maybe it sounds still too judgmental for them, like why it can still matter, even if you're primarily a counseling astrologer. Right. And, and so that's one way to approach it too. Is like, what is your hobby horse type, like topic or 
mm-hmm. thing? What's, what's, what's your thing that's like a strong opinion you have about some technique or some concept in astrology that you feel passionate enough about that you could give like an hour lecture on it? So like one of yours, for example, was um, interpreting malefics and how uh, they're often downplayed or, or, or not treated appropriately, right? Yeah, just the the idea that you know you always use kind of the best case scenario or like um, things are always possible to make good, and you know um, the lack of acknowledgement for suffering that's un- unavoidable in life sometimes, and kind of how that what that looks like in a chart. Um, and yeah, that really mattered to me for personal reasons, and then I got interested in it astrologically as a outgrowth of that. Right. So that became it was like a broader point that you wanted to make that you fleshed out then with some examples about how sometimes when people in the desire to be um, encouraging or empowering can sometimes end up doing the opposite or can sometimes not validate what people's actual lived experience is if they don't um, recognize and, and treat appropriately some of the difficult placements in their life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's very well stated for uh, that thing that I really care about and ended up starting to speak on after a bit because I was focusing on that and focusing on um, also in particular for a while was focusing on the Saturn return. And so I ended up blending those two for some lectures for a while. Um, Yeah. And that, yeah. So that kind of speaks to, you know, something that you've talked about in the past of just like representing the entire spectrum of life in astrology. So that's how that came out. Sure. So that's one way that you can approach things as well is figure out what your like hobby horse or your your something you're passionate about that might be a a unique opinion or a strong opinion that you have or something maybe that that goes against a, a trend that you've seen most astrologers doing or something like that. It doesn't have to be, but that's just an idea for generating a possible le- lecture topic. Mm -hmm. I think it's just after a while, you'll drift towards certain things. And those are good topics to kind of, if you haven't started speaking yet, to do your first talks on. Yeah, like like things, techniques, or approaches that you've drifted towards. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, So I think that's good for that question. Um, So moving on, there's like a whole string of questions that I got from different people that were sort of related to whole sign houses and my our use of that um, that I thought about sort of treating as a group. Um, some of them are kind of long though, so I'm trying to figure out how to summarize some of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Any ideas? Let's see. So, um, yeah. So the first one was wondering about how people with their ascendance in later degrees of the sign can reconcile changing to whole sign houses because of so many things shifting oftentimes from house to house um, in that case. Right. So that was the first one. So it's like um, that, like 29. How do you deal with it if you have 29 degrees uh, ascendant and switching to whole sign houses? Mm-hmm. So the other one was uh, they've noticed a lot of shift to whole sign houses over the past few years. Um, what is the relationship or the interplay between whole sign and other house systems and the role of traditionally intercepted house interpretations and chart analysis? Mm hmm. Yeah, so that was the second one. And then the third one was um, someone who was um, overall um, having a good experience using whole sign houses after switching, but after experimenting with using solar and lunar returns, um, was not finding them as effective in in those particular charts. Okay. Um, And then finally, there was one more person that said, can you speak of how you managed your reorientation to using whole sign houses versus Placidus. And this person's name was Kat. The previous question was by Sandra. The one before that was by someone named Rebecca. And the first one was by a listener named Aaron. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's let's bang these out really quickly. So the 29 degrees one, the first thing I would say to that is just that I always tell anybody, you know, even if it, if it's like a new student and I've just calculated their chart and sent it to them before, and it's got either twenty nine degrees rising or it's got zero degrees rising, when you're switching to or when you're using whole sign houses, is that's like the dangerous uh, range because when you're using whole sign houses, you have to know for sure that you have the correct rising sign and that the ascendant is definitely in that sign because whatever sign 
and this is the thing about whole sign houses, the conceptual change that people need to get a hold of in order to understand it is that within the context of whole sign houses, the purpose of the ascendant is that it marks or it designates the entire sign with the qualities of the first house. And this is similar because they used this in other approaches where they did this with, for example, the lot of fortune or the part of fortune, where the original purpose of that is you calculate the part of fortune and then whatever sign it lands in, it's not so much emphasizing that degree, but what it's doing is it's marking that entire sign with those qualities. Or it's, for example, Vadius Valens, he also recommends using the degree of the midheaven, so like the Placidus or quadrant midheaven. But what he does is he says whatever sign that falls in, it will mark that entire sign with 10th house topics, so it'll double up with whatever whole sign house it falls in. So this is part of a broader like conceptual approach to house division where the cusps, quote unquote, especially when it comes to the, the, the ascendant, is not acting as the starting point for, for the house like it does in like Placidus or equal houses, but instead it's just marking that entire sign. And as a result of that, you have to be really sure that your ascendant is in the correct sign, otherwise everything's going to be one sign off. So anytime I see a chart that has like 29 or 0 degrees rising, I basically have to do a quick rectification in order to confirm that the person's experiences are matching up with what I would what I would expect based on looking at the chart. And if they're not, I'll, I'll try shifting that ascendant degree forward or backwards to the next sign or the previous sign to see if that chart actually matches up better with the person's lived experiences at that point. And if it does, then that can be grounds for me to use the rectified chart rather than the original one that they gave me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point to start with. Um, you know, so especially pay attention to um, birth time sources in that case. Um, be like, is this definitely from your birth certificate? If it, and that's kind of the worst case scenario is like if it's like a mother's memory one and it's twenty nine degrees, because then right. you def definitely need to like double check stuff. Because I've, sure. I've had that before. Is like they're like, well, I I've had I tried whole sign houses, but it doesn't work for me. And we look at the chart, and it's like twenty nine degrees rising, and the birth time is like four p.m. So it's like clearly rounded, and it becomes one of those issues where they're not even using necessarily the correct chart. But where if I had spent ten minutes trying to rectify it, I would have sort of concluded very quickly that it should be you know, zero or one degree of the next sign, and that all of those whole sign placements actually do work out rel relatively well. Right. Yeah. So that's definitely like a first place to start. Um, I think after that, um, oftentimes, um, this is kind of blending these different, you know, four different questions about whole sign houses. But I know, for instance, when I started with it, um, I actually am very sympathetic to people um, not immediately recognizing themselves in the new chart um, because I felt pretty much that way and I didn't immediately take dual sign houses and um, and then now I use it as my primary and you most of the time only house system. So one of the things for me um, that I noticed in um, making that leap or understanding the differences that were represented when the planets moved houses in particular was um, how those planets manifested in concrete ways in those areas of life. And, you know, there's not like a strict division um, in terms of modern astrology looking at psychological things um, and traditional astrology looking at more concrete things, but there's some trends in, the, in those directions. And so I think because I was used to looking at my Placidus chart um, more in psychological terms, I would say, um, then when I saw it in whole sign, I was like, that that's not how I feel internally, you know? And um, and it was only really understanding what those placements meant about more concrete things that it made sense to me eventually. Um, so I think that's part of the shift is, and that's something that I know we've both, you know, kind of talked about and bemoaned at various times um, as like a general problem is that oftentimes when people start using um, some traditional things, they'll use like one piece but without the rest of the things. And right. then and then they're like, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't work for me. But you have to use all of them together. Right. Like not paying attention to the rulers of the houses, which is more of a traditional concept that's underutilized in um, modern astrology, or not paying attention to like sect, which really shifts things, or not paying attention to bonification and maltreatment conditions and like how to determine planetary condition in a chart and things like that. 
It's mm-hmm. part of like an overall system. And that was actually thinking back, which is funny in retrospect, I often forget about this, but that was the thing I was missing because I, I learned, I heard about whole assigned houses like a year before I, I went to Kepler and before I actually started using it because I read that like that Rob Hand was using it, who I really respected because of planets in transit and his delineations were just spot on for those interpretations on astro.com. But I was like, you know, that sounds like a really stupid idea. Uh, when I first heard about it, and and that surely that doesn't that doesn't really work in my chart. But it was only a year later when I was literally forced to take the course on Hellenistic astrology with Demetra George, starting in December of two thousand four, that I saw how whole sign houses was integrated into the rest of the system and how to use it properly within that context. And that's when I finally got it and and realized how it worked and why it worked, and was able to assess it properly within that context rather than just. Sort of picking that piece out independently of the rest of the system that it's actually a part of and that it's integrated with. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a pretty frequent thing when people don't immediately resonate to things or say these tools don't work for me. Is there's using one thing or two things, but not everything that's supposed to all work together. Um, so yeah, I would just say um, that's like a big piece of it. And for me, so it was. Some of the um, specifics around that for me when I made the switch were learning the more concrete manifestations of what those place- new placements meant in those houses. Also, um, I think one of the common resistances that, I, that I've that i definitely had personally as well is um, being used to a certain topic being emphasized in your chart and then it looking like initially it's not emphasized in, in the whole sign chart. And sometimes, um, or fairly frequently in fact, the things that you think are gone are actually just represented in different ways. And so it is like you said, the, you know, like house rulership versus a planet in the house or something like that, or major um, uh, strong aspects between planets tying two houses together or different things like that, where the thing actually hasn't disappeared that you think has disappeared. Yeah. Cause usually it's just represented in a different way. Looking at it from the whole sign approach, and that's why you have to understand all the different ways that things can be represented in a chart. Otherwise, you're not going to see that. So, like, you know, somebody's saying that the um, that some house placement is very prominent for them in their life using Placidus, but then when you switch to whole sign, it's that like the ruler of that house is is in a very prominent position in the chart or something like that. Um, or is bona fide or, or something like that. And that ends up being how it's represented from a different perspective in the whole sign chart. Right. Yeah. I had one where I had a planet in a house in Placidus and then it wasn't in that house anymore in whole sign. And I was like, well, that's totally wrong because I totally have that energy in that house. And then I realized that it was square, the the ruler of the whole sign house, like very tightly. And so I was like, oh, okay. So it is still represented there. And so there's a lot of things like that that I would, I guess, encourage people to um, pay attention to before they pass judgment on the new chart. Sure, and that, and that you know sort of echoes or repeats a theme that we were talking about earlier with the asteroids, which is sometimes people become fixated on a certain placement of a certain thing that they really resonate with, but oftentimes if there's something that's showing up really strongly in a person's life, they'll be. Uh, echoes or like waves of that coming through the chart in different ways, like repeating like the 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 rule of three, for example, of the notion that if like you see something once, it's a maybe. If you see something twice, it's it's pretty likely. And if you see something three times, then it's for sure. That's sort of a good rule still to stick by in terms of typically things come up a multiple uh, multiple different ways in a chart rather than just once. And being aware of that sometimes in switching to whole sign houses is part of just needing to figure out how to assess it um, properly or, or neutrally. Mm-hmm, definitely. So, that, then, so that's one of the things with 29 degrees rising. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, specific to 29 degrees, um, I would also, I think this is something we've talked about a little bit um, more re- recently, um, that when there are transits that are really close to that angle, even if they've slightly gone into the next sign, that can still matter because it's close to the degree angle. And so that's like the one thing that kind of counteracts otherwise paying attention to the whole sign house overlay is that mm-hmm. say if there's, uh, say if like someone has 29 Sagittarius rising, for instance, and Saturn just went back to 
um, two, one or two Capricorn and then stationed. That's right. that they're going to feel that as like a, a Saturn station near their ascendant, even though it's technically in the next sign. They will also probably notice it in second house things, but it will be like both going on. Yeah, especially if it's within like three degrees of an exact aspect or an exact hard aspect, like they're still going to feel that um, conjunction or that aspect with that angle because when you're using whole sign houses, and for some reason it's like people don't get this point or I don't I don't know why that is um, because they hear the first part, which is just you establish what degree the ascendant is in, and then that's not the cus- that's not the starting point of the first house, but instead the entire sign becomes the first house. So that technically zero degrees of that sign is the is the cu- quote unquote cusp of the first house. But the thing that all of us whole sign house users take for granted is that the exact degree of the ascendant still acts as a sensitive point. At in this instance, 29 degrees of that sign. And so sometimes one of the consequences of that is that if there's an ingress into the rising sign, the transit through the first house starts at that point. So they start seeing like first house topics as soon as, let's say, Saturn goes into zero degrees of the rising sign. But sometimes it won't culminate or won't become its most intense. Until the later part of that transit, when Saturn hits, like let's say, twenty-nine degrees exactly, so that technically it's really culminating towards the end of that transit through the the rising sign or through the first whole sign house. Or sometimes there's those lingering effects, like you're talking about, um, and this is problematic because then people think that this is confirmation that that only the quadrant houses are working, but oftentimes, but but what it is instead showing is actually just. The culmination, or sort of like a peak intensity, coming when it gets close to the exact degree. But in reality, if you pay attention, oftentimes the events and circumstances surrounding that transit began back at the sign ingress into the rising sign itself. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, both matter. You know, the whole sign setup of the houses matter, but the degrees don't not matter because of that. They still matter too. So. Right, and and so the same thing to some extent goes for the midheaven. Mm-hmm. Except with the midheaven, what we're doing is that's still a sensitive degree, but it can fall in um, whole sign houses other than the tenth. And how that ends up working is that you either have, let's say, the degree of the midheaven falls in the tenth whole sign house, at which point you know it's going to be in the same sign, but you may have an ingress of a planet moving into that sign. But if the midheaven is not doesn't take place if the actual degree is not till the very end of that sign. It may not culminate or peak with those events until it hits that exact degree. Um, or in other instances, the degree of the midheaven may fall in a sign other than the tenth, in which case it imports tenth house topics into whatever whole sign house it falls, and then you'll see a doubling up where you'll see both tenth house topics and let's say eleventh house topics if it falls in the eleventh whole sign house taking place when you get transits over that. So what's interesting about that is that means, and this is baked into the use of whole sign houses and has been for the past 20 years that astrologers have have revived and started using this technique again based on the reading of different Hellenistic astrologers like Malins, where he talks about this really explicitly at one point in book five of the anthology using this dual approach where you have the degree of the midheaven falling in different whole sign houses and doubling up of topic. It's like right there in book five and you can read it. Um, What's interesting about that is it means that all the whole sign house users have been using, in a sense, dual house systems where we're using both whole sign houses and we're integrating some components from quadrant houses into that at the same time. So it's really kind of like a hybrid approach rather than just like one house system necessarily. And that's like a misconception I think people sometimes have where they don't realize that whole sign houses house users are also trying to integrate some of those good pieces from quadrant houses as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would agree with all of that. Um, as far, I mean, there's one last piece that I often like to note, not as the first consideration, but as like the, maybe the last consideration, which is that if you are struggling with um, making whole sign houses like your primary house system, it doesn't have to mean that everything you've been looking at up to this point has no value and is completely wrong. And I that that's something that actually kind of makes me crazy with the perpetual um, house system debates or fights, um, because 
I think that's like a crucial component that is missed and that like makes fights happen when they don't actually even need to happen, which is that, um, you know, it can be another facet of your life that you're looking at. And I don't want to overstate that on the one hand, because I do personally use um, whole sign houses almost exclusively at this point. But I do do also notice sometimes, particularly with um, the uh, longer transits, the things that, like the outer planet transits, for instance, the things that um, uh, are much more slowly moving, I will sometimes notice when, and you can watch this yourself to kind of test it, this is what I've been doing for a long time, is um, when faster moving planets make hard aspects, especially conjunctions, but other hard aspects too, to the slower moving planets, um, see where that shows up in your life. And I often personally, after tracking this for a long time, have seen, um, like I said, particularly with the um, outer planet ones, them showing up in two distinct areas of life in the whole sign house as well as in the quadrant house if those differ at that time. And that's just for my own life. I don't really, I think it gets too complicated to use in consultations unless people make a note of something that um, otherwise shows up strongly in the other one. Um, so I don't know, for instance, I've had, so that's something that I've tracked for a long time. So for instance, for a long time, like I've had a Pluto transit every time there's like a, a Sun-Pluto conjunction or a Mercury-Pluto something, and I'll see it happen in two different houses, and I'll watch that happen over and over. So um, I think that's one thing where I think whole sign houses personally is the primary thing I want to use and seems to give me the most valuable information that I that I want at this point. Um, but you don't have to completely disavow what you were looking at before or disavow what your own life or your own psychology looked like in that chart. Um, and I think that's, again, it's something I don't want to overstate, um, but I think sometimes the whole sign houses um, shows better the concrete circumstances of it in different areas of life. And I think sometimes the um, quadrant can show up some more psychological things, but I want to, I don't want to say that too strongly. Um, but yeah, I have in consultations even once in a while, not very often, but once in a while, um, I'll mention it if something is really strikingly different and is showing up strongly in the person's life. I remember I had one person in their Saturn return, and I can't remember if the Saturn and whole sign houses was in the third or the fifth, but it was one of those. And it made sense, and we discussed why it made sense in that particular context. But like towards the end of the consultation, um, they noted that their parent and also grandparent were all going through their Saturn returns right now. And in and then I looked and I noticed that in quadrant, the, um, the Saturn would be in the fourth. And so I said, oh, that's really interesting. And we discussed something a little bit about that as well. Um, it would so, be in the fourth, but not in the same sign as the IC? Um, you know, it's been a while, so I can't say exactly because, yeah, I pay attention also to if it's in the same sign as the IC. Right. Yeah. But, you know, so it's anyway, you can pay attention to that when it comes up. You don't have to be like all of Placidus is wrong now, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that is disappointing, is kind of sad to me about some of the recent like strong reactions amongst quadrant house users that are getting defensive and trying to pretend that old sign houses never existed or is a recent invention is that I was hoping it was heading more in the direction of figuring out how to reconcile the two systems. And that was when I even put out my original whole sign house lecture a few years ago where I was trying to promote the benefits or the things that I thought were positive that were like selling points of quadrant houses. I said at the end of it that we really need to figure out how to reconcile these because I think there is an interface between the two, and it may not be that like one is right and the other is wrong, but it may be that there's a way to try to um, use both of them at the same time, which is something that we're talking about a little bit, even just by using the degree of the midheaven and the degree of the ascendant, but also that there might be, you know, an actual means to or a reason to use both as overlapping systems at the same time, and I think that's what would be much more productive and useful at this point in terms of learning how to f figuring out how to reconcile that because as far as I'm concerned I haven't seen anybody successfully pull it off there's like a occasionally people will will make offhanded references like that where they sometimes say well 
maybe the whole sign approach is more concrete and the, the quadrant approach is more psychological, but I think that may be just coming from, or it's not always clear if that's not just coming from the fact that quadrant houses is the dominant approach in psychological modern astrology, which is what everyone's used to using quadrant houses when they first learn modern astrology in that context, a largely psychological context, versus whole sign houses tends to be more of a Hellenistic or a traditional thing, and so therefore it's being used in a more concrete con context, and therefore it's been hard for me sometimes to know if that's a genuine thing where it is actually more of a psychological or a subjective thing for quadrant ha for quadrant houses and more an objective thing for whole sign houses. I'm open if that's actually the case and that's the way to reconcile those two approaches. I just want to be careful that we're not getting like false positives from the context in which they've traditionally been used even if that's not like objectively how, but we do have to come up with some reason or some conceptual motivations for re reconciling them or at least mm -hmm. that ideally would be the case. Even like 10 years ago, I remember when Ben Dykes was thinking he was going to make the transition from quadrant houses to whole sign houses, and I encouraged him just to do it more carefully than I did and more slowly and think it through and see if there's any pieces from quadrant houses that he wanted to retain that were still useful. Um, and I think he ended up still doing like I did and like most of us end up doing, which is still ending up primarily just using whole sign houses. But I think there are still some creative ways to reconcile those issues that I hope astrologers start focusing on more rather than just this sort of like pissing contest of whose house system is better. Yeah, and that's part of why it makes me crazy uh, when this you know keeps getting revived, the, these kind of fights, because um, they seem so unnecessary, not just in the sense of like, why do we have to fight people kind of thing, but like just in terms of a logical uh, fallacy, like that one, you know, it's not always the case that one thing being true has to completely falsify the other thing. And there is a way in which you can see maybe these different house systems giving different pieces of information. And while you don't want to go to the other extreme and be like, it's all right, you know, yeah, like, and like every, any, everything anything works. goes, anything goes, everything works, you know, everything is as valid as everything else without really like critically evaluating um, how they're working. Um, I do think that's more or less the answer. And that's why I don't understand why people keep the, the premise of the fight is always that, that which I think is a false premise, which is like for whole sign houses to work, the other ones have to not work. And give you like no good information, right? Well, the well, well, people just come at it from the perspective of like this is the approach that I use, and it, it really works for me in practice. So therefore, right. that other approach either doesn't work or can't work. Or if you're saying that my approach that I use in practice doesn't work, even though I've had that validated in my approach, then you're you're wrong automatically, right? Um, which is almost like the the elephant like parable type. Is it is that yeah. the correct analogy? Like yeah, the, it is. The it is. Two two blind people that are like feeling like an elephant and then trying to describe it or something like that. What, what was that analogy again? Like I'm not even. Yeah, well, I think it's usually like three or four people. But yeah, you got the okay. gist. You basically, you know, people who can't see but are like touching an elephant and they're touching different different pieces of it and they're describing it and like they don't have to all be wrong. They can actually all be right, but they're touching different things. Right, so, like one's touching its leg and trying to describe it this way, and the other's touching the trunk and describing it this way. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, and I feel like it sounds so basic to say, but I want to emphasize it anyway because I feel like it keeps happening. Is like it doesn't have to mean that. Like just because I use whole sign houses and it works well for me, doesn't have to. That doesn't mean that I'm saying that like you can get no useful information from whatever house system you've been using and feel you've been using successfully. It may be giving you different information, and I think it's good to critically assess what information you're getting from each one and, you know, see. And I think that's, unfortunately, the th it's much easier to just pick one and be like, this is it, because most people aren't going to take the time to, like, you know, um, rigorously look at, like, the same chart in, like, many different systems and then like keep doing that with lots of charts because like we have other things to do, you know. So um, but it would be useful for some people to do that. So anyway, I just I guess I would urge people to pay attention to what they can see in the whole sign chart if they're making that switch. 
making sure you're using all of the other tools that go along with that and not just switching the house system alone. Um, you know, pay attention to what information is being shown in a different way, perhaps, than you're used to before, that, but that might still be showing up. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then be open to um, possibly more than one house system working in some sort of way. Right. And the biggest thing that people don't get that people need to understand is just there's different approaches to house division, and that's okay. There's at least three different major ways to doing house division. One of them is this symbolic sign-based approach of a sign that falls in a sign, it marks that entire sign, then the next sign is marked with certain qualities, then the other sign is marked with certain qualities. There's the equal house approach where it just measures equal 30 degree segments from the degree of the ascendant. And then there's the quadrant approach with measuring, um, basically trisecting the arcs between the degree of the ascendant and the degree of the meridian midheaven, and then using those 12 sectors in order to mark the houses. And one of the, the what's happening is just people are, are, once they get into a specific approach, they're saying that, like for example, quadrant houses. What's happening is people are getting defensive about quadrant houses and saying, "Well, that's not how house division work, or the, or, or that whole sign houses isn't a real approach to house division because it's not incorporating the degree of the midheaven and then trisecting the arc between that and the degree of the ascendant or what have you." Um, but it, it's so it's just a matter of being able to open up your mind a little bit and realize there's different approaches to. Dividing the houses and being able to understand what the unique benefits are of each each approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. Were there any other pieces of that? I feel like we addressed that pretty thoroughly. Yeah. So that's the twenty nine degree thing, for the most part. Um, the other one was, I think, about interception, basically. And oh, right. Like my thing about interceptions is when I was studying modern astrology for like the first. I don't know, five or six years of my study, and even for the first like 10 years of my study, I always got the sense that people didn't know what to do with interceptions and that that wasn't a very well defined part of like modern astrology, where I really got the sense in 20th century astrology that interceptions were like this oddity. And I still think even today that um, there is an issue with quadrant houses, even, even if we acknowledge that the degree of the quadrant midheaven and the IC need to be incorporated. And that there may be something to quadrant houses, there's still a lot of ambiguity about how to trisect the quadrants and how to divide the quadrants into three houses each. So there's four quadrants between the degrees of the angles, and then you divide those into three or trisect them. And it's like people can explain the math behind the different approaches to quadrant houses, but they can't usually explain why they would want to use. You know this approach versus another, and that is a major continuing lingering issue with quadrant houses. And and nowhere does that become more of an issue than in the the area of interceptions, because it's like in some quadrant systems there'll be inter interceptions, and others there won't. It really depends on what quadrant system you're using, how you're dividing things up, and once you get that, and let's say there are interceptions in the chart. Um, I've never felt that it was very clearly articulated, and it always seemed like an issue where a lot of astrologers didn't really fully know how to deal with that. I, I know there's some who now have come up with explanations and they have like a specific interpretive approach, but I don't think that that's been generally speaking like widely accepted what the the single approach to interceptions has been or has always been. Mm, yeah, when I'd always when I first got into astrology, it was modern astrology first, and the thing I had had read in a few different places about interceptions was that it was supposed to represent, if you had planets in the intercepted signs, it was supposed to re represent something that couldn't easily express itself or was like uh, hidden in some way. And I always felt like it was a bit of a stretch, honestly, um, that that was the explanation. I felt like that was the theory, but I didn't necessarily see it like really jump out at me as like corroborated. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, to me, that was always one of the benefits of whole sign houses rather than something that was lost is that there are no interceptions, at least in whole sign houses, and that becomes a non issue. And then to me, that always kind of explained then 
why that was such a murky area in modern astrology, where it didn't seem like a lot of astrologers had a good answer to either what to do with interceptions, A, or B, which specific approach to quadrant houses to use and why. Because certain, like like even some of the explanations that people come up with of like, well, you know, I use Placidus because that's what the default on astro.com is, which isn't a good ex- explanation, or I use Regio Montanus because that's what Lily used, which isn't a good explanation. Um, yeah, it sort of cleaned cleaned up that issue. So I, you know, this is one of those questions where the answer is that there isn't a good answer to it because it, to me, it's like a non issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't. Do you have anything else to add to that? No, that's pretty much it. Like I said, it. You know, I learned what it was supposed to mean. I was never really like strongly struck by. That being validated, and then I started using whole sign. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. The other sub question with this was I'm experimenting with whole sign houses and notice that they do not seem to be as effective when reading solar and lunar return charts. Uh, do you cast solar and lunar returns for this house system? Have others found that this is similar? Um, yeah. So the answer to this question is that I. Did experiment a lot with solar and lunar returns back when I was doing modern astrology. And I remember when John Townley's book came out on lunar returns, and I was really excited about that because there wasn't a lot of good treatments on it up to that point. Um, But over the years, especially once I got into traditional astrology, I started paying less and less attention to solar returns and especially lunar returns because I was using other techniques like annual perfections and zodiac releasing, where I was already getting so much information from those. And the information I was getting was more valuable, and the context was more clear in terms of specifically what I was supposed to do with it and how it was useful. And it took up enough time that I didn't find the need to resort to like solar returns because I was always already doing annual perfections, which were telling me what the major themes were in that year. So I'm not sure at this stage if there's something majorly significant that I'm missing by not doing solar returns. And I acknowledge that there could be. And I've been meaning to go back to that to look into it to see, you know, if I can integrate that into what I do now in a way that's useful and effective. And I know there's some traditional astrologers that really do emphasize solar returns, um, so and, and integrate them with annual perfections, for example. But it hasn't been like necessary for me so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have largely the the same response and for the same reasons. Um, I will say that I did. One return chart one year a while back um, that ended up being super striking to me, and it was whole sign. And um, so, I mean, I don't routinely use them, but I feel like the logic should not necessarily switch in terms of return charts not working in, um, you know, whole sign houses. And I think it may be more of an issue of something about you know, return charts or how we read them or like if we're missing tools, uh, you know, to make them more useful or something like that. I mean, I don't want to diminish if someone's already having good experiences reading return charts. Um, but I I feel like if there's an answer, the answer might be more on that side rather than the the house system suddenly not working for those type of charts. Right. One of the few it just reminded me that one of the few critical um Comments I got on a review of my book last year, when after my book on Hellenistic astrology, titled "Hellenistic Astrology: The Study of Fate and Fortune," available at fine bookstores everywhere, uh, when it came out last year, a lot of reviews came out. And one of the few critical remarks I got is that I didn't deal with solar returns, and this was from an astrologer who finds solar returns to be very important in her practice using traditional astrology. And um, I ended up writing to her, and one of the things that I explained is that. There's so few references to solar returns in the Hellenistic tradition that it's not really clear how they dealt with them or interpreted them. There's just like a few occasional offhanded references in passing to the idea that there is or or could be some sort of solar return chart, but it's not until the medieval tradition, several centuries later, that we have some of the first surviving full treatments of solar returns by authors like Abu Mashar. Who has just this crazy elaborate sort of approach to interpreting solar returns, which Ben Dykes published a translation of that text a few years ago. And I think we did, I think there's an episode of the podcast where I interviewed Ben about that. So um, 
that's one of the other issues for me in approaching this is it was not clearly explicated in the Hellenistic tradition, and there may have been a different way that they're approaching it. And that was the thing that made me hesitant about even trying to broach the topic in my book, because Valens at one point does make, when he does spend like a paragraph talking about solar returns, he does something really weird where he does this sort of solar lunar return where he calculates the planets at the time of the solar return, but in order to calculate the ascendant, he calculates the lunar return that will take place in the month after the solar return, and then whatever the rising sign is at that time, he'll use that rising sign using whole sign houses and apply that to the planetary placements in the solar return chart. So that's really weird, and one of the questions is, was he doing that? Was that a standard approach? Was that actually the approach that other Hellenistic astrologers used? But because none of them go into it much, we just don't know the fact that that was the standard approach. Was that just a unique approach that, that was unique or idiosyncratic to Valens? Um, what motivated that approach? Did, they, did he do that because for specific conceptual reasons, because they thought that that union between the sun and the moon in the month of the person's solar return, that there was something really crucial about that conceptually or symbolically? Or were they doing it because maybe it was easier to calculate the rising sign at the time of the lunar return than it would have been at the exact degree of the solar return for just for like practical or astronomical reasons we don't know so it's like this very underexplored area that i was not you know the book was already like 700 pages long so i wasn't going to add another 20 pages trying to unpack that issue mhm mm yeah definitely but, but it's one of those areas of research that i hope somebody of, of which there's like tons of areas of research and most of the students of my hellenistic course know at this point some of them, and I'm going to start, especially in the near future, like outlining as specific assignments or research projects. Like, this is an issue in Hellenistic astrology. I haven't been able to fully get into this because I've had other areas of research that I've focused on instead. But I hope that somebody will take this and research it and run with it at some point and figure this issue out. And that's one of them that I wanted to outline for students of my Hellenistic course. And there's like a, a bunch of other things like that as well that some of my students are working on. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I mean, I never, um, you know, f consistently and for a long period of time got uh, really good information um, from solar returns um, before I switched to whole sign houses. And I think it's one of those things that like sometimes it, it works and you're like, oh, I noticed something from that. But I never, at least personally, felt like it uh, was really striking and accurate information all of the time, or even most of the time. So yeah, I think there's more research to be had. I know that um, Nina Griffin is one person who has been starting to, or, or has been um, trying to integrate some other pieces into just looking at where the solar return falls. And I know that she um, had a lecture on that at the last UAC and even was saying, you know, like if you just use the solar return, like you maybe get a little information, but maybe not consistently and maybe not a lot of information. So I think there's a lot of other pieces that maybe we need to know about how to make solar returns more useful. Sure. Yeah. Nina has done that lecture. And I know uh, Ben Dykes and Demetra George have also done lectures where they talk about using perfections together with solar returns mm -hmm. in order to do things more effectively. So mm -hmm. And I think that was what you're alluding to that Nino probably integrated as well was needing to use things like perfections to get the full sort of um, power of the solar return. Yeah, that was one of the additional pieces that she was using. Yeah, okay. so so I guess in conclusion, like I'm not sure if the house system is the main problem. Um, without wanting to, you know, overstep that, but that's that would be my question. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. There's yeah, there's a lot of issues there. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, that concludes the like large section here on whole sign houses and like the four different questions we got on that. Um, we're at two hours and ten minutes, so we have a bunch of other questions <laughs> that we didn't get to. Um, I don't know if we if we try to plow through a few more of them or if we wrap this up at this point. What do you think? Uh, let me take a look real quick. Um, yeah, I mean. I could do just like one more maybe, or we could just stop because <laughs> it has been a while. 
Yeah, I think what I want to do, because some of these are like carryover questions from two other prior Q and A's earlier this year, and I feel bad for not getting to them, but I might want to do a separate episode of like the casual astrology podcast that's available to patrons to answer some of the rest of these, just so I can finally get some of them, get recordings of some of them down. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them, let's let's end with this one um, by Paul, who asked something. <laughs> that's going to be a long answer. You think that's too big of a? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's too big. We can't end on that one. <laughs> Okay. I mean, um, I, I could do the the challenging house placement one. I think that would be less of a long answer. I mean, that almost seems like a bigger, it, it broader could issue to me. Go, but you could also have a short answer to it. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, let's just do both because I want to have just a short answer to Paul's question. Okay. Because well, the answer is Paul's question is something I think is often implied but never really discussed often enough. What is the purpose of astrology and what role does the astrologer play for their client? And the short answer is just that the, you know, there's many different applications of astrology, and there's different astrologers that approach the subject with different philosophical and and religious and like metaphysical assumptions about what they're doing with astrology. And there's no way to answer that question in a way that's gonna be true for every single astrologer in the world. I mean, we could attempt to like draw it back as much as possible to come up with some sort of like core thing that would be broadly applicable to a lot of astrologers, but even doing that is going to be incredibly difficult because you're going to have to generalize like like a lot in order to get there. Mhm. Mm yeah, I would agree. That is a good short answer actually <laughs> because if you really unpack it, it's a, it's a long discussion, but um you know, there right. are you know, there's all the different branches that you can use astrology for. I don't know if the assumption was specific to natal astrology. Um, yeah. So, I mean. Right. But, but e even if we assumed it was natal astrology, it's like, are you coming at it from the perspective of an astrologer that be believes in reincarnation and that like we're reincarnating at different times to work off karma and that things we experience in this life are largely the result of past actions in a previous life? Are you approaching it from the perspective of astrology being like causal or astrology working through synchronicity so that the planets are like causing things to happen in your life and therefore as the astrologer you're going to count counsel people differently than if you think the planets are not causing things they're just reflecting what's happening on earth are you approaching it like what other paradigms are there in astrology yeah i mean there there are a bunch of those kind of things i mean my main answer i guess you know without fully unpacking it would be if you're just focusing on natal astrology as like an assumption is that you're there to give like a bigger bigger picture insights um uh about what's going on either in their life as a whole or at certain times um that they may not fully see otherwise even if they may partially see right so you're giving the person perspective on their life could mm -hmm. be the most general or generic answer that would be like broadly true to all astrologers. And that's tied in with that sounds almost overly generic, which it has to be to cover everybody, but it actually ties it back into something more specific that Robert Zoller told me once uh, when I was living with him actually in Maryland like 10 years ago at Project Hindsight, very briefly. But one of the most striking things he ever said to me was that astrology, and I'm not gonna I'm gonna paraphrase it here, but he said something to the effect of astrology allows you to know things that you otherwise shouldn't be able to know. And that was the biggest thing. And that sort of ties back into the answer that you just gave is you're giving people perspective on their life based on something that's that's giving you information that you shouldn't otherwise be able to have. Mm -hmm. And that's basically true for, for just about any approach or any branch to astro astrology, especially if we're talking about natal astrology. Um, and so therefore what you're that's what you're able to do, or that's what astrology is enabling you to do, or that's the tool that you have to work with. And so therefore, what you're actually doing with it, or what most astrologers are doing with it, is giving people perspective on their life. Mm -hmm. Or let's say a different perspective, allowing people to step out and look at their life from a different vantage point, which you know most astrologers would argue is a more objective standpoint. Um, right. I know Zoller, for example, that was actually one of Zoller's big hobby horses that I didn't ever I didn't fully agree with him at the time but I've come to understand better I don't still don't fully agree with him but I understand better now why he said that that astrology was like he took it in an extreme position and said astrology is the only objective means 
of having an objective perspective of our life. And that astrology was like truly and fundamentally objective. And that was the biggest issue that people had with it is it could be brutally honest about what your life is actually about or what's going on in it, almost almost to like a fault or something. Mm. I mean, I would like halfway agree with that, although I think right. there are like crucial caveats about human beings being the the medium for that information, in which case it's not objective, you know? You just right. try to be as objective as possible, but the, like, um flawed medium, which is the astrologer and their attempt to interpret it because they have to actually perform the act that they actually have to perform in order to accomplish it and you and get the information is an interpretive one, which is inherently, you know, flawed and problematic because it, it requires interpretation which is partially subjective and um, not like as clear cut as we would like it. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think the general sense is that you're giving people a, um, a different perspective on their life and also in some ways a bigger picture perspective that's less personal to them because everyone has all of those planets in a chart and you can describe what they generally mean and it's a different way if you don't know astrology it's a different way of seeing your life and i think there's astro astrology isn't the only thing like that but there's like a number of ways in which you can get a different perspective on your life than the kind of frameworks or paradigms that you're used to thinking about it and i think there's something inherently useful about that that can kind of spark good things sure definitely um yeah so i think that's a good answer See, that was relatively concise. It only took <laughs> yeah, us like 10, we 10 didn't minutes. really fully unpack it, which could take a whole episode in itself. But <laughs> yeah, well, that would be a good episode to do perhaps at some point. Right. Um, but then, of course, like our answer to that is going to be different than you know other some other astrologers might be. If you put ten astrologers in a room together, um, right. but I think a good we conference panel. Yeah, I think we did successfully <laughs> answer that in the most generic, general way that's as broadly applicable as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to answer this last one that you wanted to do? <laughs> I mean, I, I, we can. Yeah. Um, I just have a few things to say about it. So the question which was sent in um, by someone named Jen was, how do you approach challenging house placements in the natal chart? For example, the chart ruler being in the 12th house, are there any rules or ways to mediate this placement? Um, and she gave the example of a Leo rising with the sun and cancer in the 12th house. So... Um, I think this is kind of like the double-edged sword of the ideas getting back out there that there are, in fact, good and bad placements and things like that. Um, because I think the positive of that is that that is actually how life exists to a, a pretty strong degree. And so it's negating reality to not point out in, in a chart like what at least as the astrologer, not necessarily like in the same words with a client, but you know, to be able to see things that are more positive and more challenging. Um, but I think sometimes people then get overly scared about some of those placements. Um, and in some ways that ties back in with one of our um, previous answers, which is that you need to take into account all of the factors and not only one. And so for instance, in an ascendant ruler in the 12th, is it being helped? By any other planets? Is it having um, Venus or Jupiter help it out? Is it um, sextile the midheaven? And so it's being made more, op you know, uh, able to operate um, in a prominent way as opposed to just in the 12th without being tied into an angle. Um, right. Are there any mitigations? Are there any mitigations, basically, is the general category. So, um, that's a huge piece. So I, I guess I would just like not jump to be like this planet is in a bad house and therefore it's all terrible. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, you know, that dialogue is really important. So if this isn't, for instance, your own chart, but you're talking with a client or a friend or family member or something, um, there's usually some sort of positive things or neutral things um, in terms of manifestations of any given house. And so even if it's a so-called bad house, it's not it's probably not going to be exclusively and only bad things uh, manifesting from that placement. You know, it it's usually a mix of things. Like usually house placements aren't like only one thing ever in that person's life. 
um, comes from that placement. Usually it's more than one thing, at least over the course of a lifetime. So, you know, um, dialogue is really important in terms of, you know, this person has already lived with that placement for a while. And so they probably, if they're not super young, they probably have some idea of how that's played out already for them. You could list a bunch of different possible topics in that house that, you know, can run from the more challenging to many of the neutral ones to the most positive ones and see kind of what they've experienced so far. Um, and, you know, so, and that can be useful in itself, I think, to point out maybe some of the overlooked good things about that placement. Not to be Pollyanna-ish, which I am definitely not, but, um, you know, sometimes though people can get more of in a mindset of only seeing the bad parts and not seeing anything else that is actually going on. Sure. Yeah. I mean, because that's hard because especially the traditional text will tend to state things in extremes. So it's like they'll only state the negative parts of like some of the ch more challenging houses or they'll only state the more positive things of some of the positive houses. And so it's really on the astrologer learning that and reviving some of that stuff in modern times to understand what the worst case scenario could be, but also what the best case scenario could be. And, and every house placement or every house in the chart has like a more negative possible set of scenarios and, and manifestation and also a most positive version and as well as a bunch of shades of gray in between. So maybe just being able to establish what some of the shades of gray and what some of the extremes are in both end of the spectrum is is the starting point. Definitely. You know wanna you want to validate what people have actually experienced and also explore what they might be overlooking, um, as well as other things that they might try. Um I think uh, like both of us, for instance, have noticed this kind of hilarious repetition of eighth house placements being tied to people who work in banking or accounting or things like that. The eighth yeah. house is considered a bad house, but this is like really common. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the few positive things that does at least even come up in the traditional text where Valens talks about it being the eighth house being the partner's money because it's the second from the seventh using derivative houses. And then more broadly, you can expand that to if the first house is in the birth chart is the native and the, yourself, the seventh house is others in general. And if the second house is like your money, then the eighth house is like other people's money in general. And so the eighth house can then symbolically be associated with this broad general category of other people's money, which I always understood sort of abstractly, but then it's funny seeing it when the eighth house is prominent and situated positively, or when there's planets there situated positively, or when there's mitigations, like a planet in the eighth house that's also making, let's say, a, a very close aspect within three degrees to the degree of the quadrant midheaven, which is a mitigating factor, um, it'll tend to manifest more constructively. And it's funny seeing that over and over again. People say like that they're an accountant was one of my clients, or what was the one you had recently? Um, a mortgage lender. There, I've had a lot of those actually. With yeah, house placements. And so have I. And it's funny then that that's a that's a literal placement that matches the symbolism, but especially when it's placed well, it will tend to be more the constructive end of that. So sometimes being able to identify what the more constructive significations associated with the bad houses could be, or another one that I use in my book and my course. And actually, I should mention my book. I recently released it on Google Books as an ebook. Um, so if anybody's ever been waiting to get my book for the ebook version, it's finally out. So just do a search for Hellenistic Astrology on Google Books and you'll find it. Um, one of the examples I use of a person that had the ruler of the, the first and the tenth and the sixth, which traditionally in ancient texts was traditionally like the house of illness and sickness and suffering. Um, but it's like extremely well placed. It's like trying the degree of the midheaven. It's also bona fide, so it's being made positive by other benefics in the chart that are aspecting it. And the person is a is a doctor who who focuses on like patient treatment and eventually became like the head of a hospital and then the head of like a larger um, association for doctors. And that was again a, a positive manifestation of um a more potentially difficult placement, but what ends up happening is that the person used it for good and that she works with people who are sick, but has not that doesn't necessarily mean that she herself has become like afflicted by being ill or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
I, I have a similar example chart with someone with the ruler of the 10th and the 12th and is also a doctor. Um, so it's like working with sick people because the 6th and the 12th can have some overlapping um, you know, qualities of dealing with sick people. Sure. Um, and then some of them, especially with mitigations, like the last two US presidents have the ruler of the ascendant and the 12th. So Obama had that, um, but it was mitigated and well-placed by being in its own sign. And I think aspecting the midheaven or something. And then I think Bush uh, Jr. had that as well. He had Leah rising with the sun in cancer, which I think was also mitigated, if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah, it's not. there's no placement that's like, complete deal breaker end of the world. And especially this is where, and that's basically why I'm giving that lecture at Norwalk next year on reception, is things like reception or things like aspects to the degree of the mid-Evan um, are crucial mitigating factors. And if you're not paying attention to them, you may not realize why a placement is working out more positively than you might otherwise expect or, or something like that. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, and then just to kind of cap all that off, um, the question about um, any rules or ways to remediate that pl placement. I mean, I think it's always useful to suggest some of the positive possibilities that someone may not have considered in terms of, you know, activities, activities for their life or, you know, things they might want to focus on or something. Um, but, um, you know, I have some feelings in terms of kind of the casual way of using the word remediation in terms of um, the ability to completely avoid um, what otherwise might be challenging about that placement. I think oftentimes how it shows up is more than one thing, as I mentioned before, and there can be side by side something that um, someone can get some positive use out of in that area, as well as something that is more challenging, you know, say if it's not like a super positive placement that's not mitigated. Um, and so I think that that, again, could be another whole podcast on its own, the digression around that. Um, in terms of the actual ability to completely remediate away difficulty in life. Yeah, that actually is something I've been thinking about a lot lately as well. And I'd like to have discussion about because I've been thinking about like the ancient concept of like the substitute king and stuff like that, where in like the Mesopotamian tradition, you know, they had there's like if there's like a bad omen and it was ex extremely repeated and it indicated the king was going to die or something like that, um, they would like substitute somebody else and make him the king for like a week or something. And then uh, he would not be king after that. Um, the other king would come back in and take over. And that always sounded kind of wacky to me in a way, but I've sort of been understanding it more lately and been experimenting with and thinking about this idea of substituting an event or like giving up something. And it suddenly started making me understand some of those religious practices about like giving up something during mm. certain like religious periods and the idea of like sacrificing or like propitiating something where, where you're actually doing something that's hard or difficult for you and you experience it as hard or difficult, but in some way it almost might be taking up the symbolism and sort of like eating up the symbolism of that time in a way that's more controllable for you. So you're still doing it, you're still experiencing the thing that's challenging, but it's not as challenging as it could have been. It's not like the worst case scenario or something like that. I'm still still working on that. It's still something I'm thinking about and sort of like working out conceptually and theoretically. But um yeah, that would be a fun discussion sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have I have a few like soapbox feelings about it tied tied into earlier things we were discussing where, you know, I I I do feel like it's kind of cast about casually sometimes, the idea that that's completely possible to remediate away everything about a placement if you just do something else that also fits the symbolism but is more positive. Yeah, I mean, that's and that's one of my big reservations and concerns about the revival of the magical tradition because even though I've been interested in, in talking about that and exploring that over the past few months, I'm actually nervous about that because th that gets abused like a lot in the Indian tradition, the idea of like, you know, you can buy like an ex expensive gemstone, and all of your negative karmas will be erased, or something like that. Or that you can do things in order to avoid suffering in your life, or to completely sidestep it. And that's really not realistic. And in some instances, maybe giving people like a, a sort of false sense of hope about being able to do something magical in order to avoid any 
challenges or like hardships in one's life, which just doesn't seem realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's, you know, as with, you know, many of these things, I feel like, you know, some of my feelings about it came from personal experience, but I don't always think it's possible to completely substitute something for something else. And usually when someone, I mean, and one can talk about degrees, of course, but um, I feel like usually when things are particularly challenging in, in one topic in a life, um, like we were talking about earlier, it's usually because it's shown in a bunch of different ways, just not just one way. And right. so it's not necessarily like one placement that you can remediate and then get rid of that. But again, could be a long yeah. regression there. <laughs> That's a whole, yeah, whole, yeah. <laughs> other, whole other thing, but we'll have to save that for another time. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it. We actually made it through. Like, it doesn't seem like it. We made it through a fair bit of questions here. There's still mm -hmm. a number that are left over, but I think I might deal with these in a separate podcast for the Casual Astrology Podcast somewhere here in the near future. Um, maybe I'll I'll buy you a, a chai or something, and you'll join me for that. We'll <laughs> <Thank> see. <you. laughs> All right. I'll let you decide on that later on. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for joining me today, Lisa. Yeah, good discussion. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for listening. All right. And people can find out more information about you on your website, lisashime.com, right? Yes. I do consultations and elections and things like that. Excellent. And you've got, what do we have? There's like two lectures on your website for sale, right? Yeah. I have a, a Saturn return and sect lecture on there from a past conference about how day and night charts affect Saturn returns. And then I have another one about the repetition of the 12-year annual perfection cycle and how um, the same topics keep coming up over and over again as um, that 12-year cycle repeats the focus on a particular house. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Both of those are a really good lecture on sect that really shows you how to use sect as well as Saturn returns. And a really good lecture on perfections and showing you how to use those 12 year repetitions to anticipate and make predictions about the future. Mm -hmm. So, check those out at lisashine.com. Uh, for me, my main thing is my Hellenistic course. So, if you want to learn more about my technical approach to astrology, you can find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com uh, since new students can sign up at any time. So, feel free to check that out. I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Uh, so thanks everyone for for listening or for watching on YouTube. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible each month. Would not be able to do it without you. And uh, I think that's it. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>